welcome, ladies and gentlemen. So this is Ceremonial Witchcraft. I am your host, Corey LeBlanc, and I am happy to be here. Now, tonight's episode isn't going to be really an episode. Um, I'm going to play some Jordan Peterson. Um, a video he goes into a little bit about Hitler and a couple other concentration camps that we don't know about through uh, what you learn through the uh, fucking archipelago. What the fuck is it called? Um, one moment there. Sorry, everybody. I should have been more prepared. It's a Gulag Archipelago. Um, and I'm also going to take the opportunity, since I'm playing Jordan Peterson, obviously I'll put the YouTube links that I got these videos I'm playing from, and I'm going to put uh, his books, The Twelve Rules uh, to Life, uh, Chaotic Whatever, Maps of Meeting, and a few other things I found, uh, PDFs of uh, Jordan Peterson's work, so... There should be about four or five PDFs on here, one being the Gulag Archipelago, which I just finished reading, and it's awesome and fascinating. Um, can't really say awesome, but, well, you'll see when you read it. Um, but yeah, and I, know that I just started watching, uh, reading um, Maps of Meeting. Uh, I don't know why I decided to do that first, but then I'm going to be moving on to um, uh, The Twelve Rules by Jordan, Sim Jordan Peterson, so... Yeah, I'm gonna put these on here after I say what I have to say and after I play who I have to play. Um, so yeah, in my last episode, I and the well, first part of my video, I talked about how you know Birch talked about World War II and how the U.S. Great Depression affected the whole world and all that, which isn't which is true. But I I also stated the fact that Germany went through a world depression. Uh, first inflation, because we had inflation in the States and in Canada, which is kind of like, you know, a very basic version of it. It's like your your milk at your corner store. So let's say back then, which I don't even think it was a dollar, but if it was a dollar for the three or four liters of milk, well, during war times, whenever, or after war times, or when people start having money issues, they would inflate the price to what it is now, let's say $4 um, or $5. Just because they know people needed it, you know, but these people were taking advantage of the fact that people needed stuff. And, and you know, I know in Canada, anyways, we made inflation um, illegal. But anyways, so uh, inflation, he talks about inflation and, you know, the, he talks about how they had to pay for all the war crimes and all this and that. Like I said before, too, what I learned was Austria-Hungary was the first one to declare war in World War One, but... They got knocked out of the war earlier, and Germany was the last man standing, but essentially lost, and they had to pay all those war crimes back. But anyways, it goes into depth on that, so I just thought it was important to play. Um, like, once again, I'm not saying this is true or false. I learned this in school, so it could be argued that this is false. Coming from Jordan Peterson, who also learns everything from university and teaches university, you can also argue that, you know, yeah, he's he's very well learned. But is the shit he learned, you know, accurate or not? Who the fuck's to know? And I think that's where I like uh, I like magic and esoteric because it's not necessarily what's real or fake or facts or historically correct. It's about what you know resonates with you. Or, you know, not so much always resonates with you in the oh I agree with that kind of way. You know, some things you read are uncomfortable and go against your beliefs, but on some level you know they're it's to be true and stuff like that. And when you decode it with esoteric knowledge, when you take the Bible, like I said, and and the way Jordan Peterson breaks down the Bible as symbolism, you know, that's how we should be taking these books and we shouldn't be actually taking any books, literally. Even if they are literal, you can still use symbolic meaning and true stories and whatnot, you know. Um, but anyways, before I play the Jordan Peterson stuff and get to working on putting all those uh, links to the PDFs on here, I just wanted to go into what I was talking about last time. I wanted to talk about how to find your passion and purpose. And if you were starting your initiation um, and you didn't really know what your passion and purpose was, and that, that wasn't gonna, I wasn't saying that was a bad thing or a good thing, I personally think that's a good thing because it's hard to know what your passion and purpose is whenever you are going through the initiation when you just basically opened your root chakra and you just realized everything is bullshit that you've been taught and you know you're trying to figure out what's real and what's fake and you finally found a magical system or um, you know an east yogi system or prana or you know chi or qui-gon whatever you're using you know, whether it's Apollo, Santeria, or it's using uh, different Norse mythologies or heathenism, whatever it is, you found that works for you. Any kind of witchcraft, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Ceremonial magic doesn't matter. 
whatever you decided to do, whether or not you're going to stick with that, if you're going to branch out, if you're going to keep all of these back of the tricks like uh, Birch does, or you're eventually going to leave it all together, it doesn't matter. But the point is you start somewhere, you know, and if you're starting your initiation, you're doing the banishings, you're doing the groundings, you know, you're, you're setting intentions on your temples to picking deities and all that, that's great, keep doing that. It'll eventually help you get the mental clarity because once you clear your mental clutter out, which is kind of point I was trying to get at, and I never think I said, maybe I did say, but you're kind of organizing your thoughts because to me the way it works, I've often used this, the phrase, if we change the word thoughts with spirits, then it might help people banish the negative thoughts faster or better or more accurate and stop forgetting to do this exercise. They'll realize that all the thoughts around them are slower or kind of like spirits and I don't mean that I mean you can take that whatever way you want whichever way works for you is kind of what I want you to do with that and I'm not here to tell you that there's actually evil and good forces around you all the time however you know the whole little conscious the person's conscious you know the good conscious the bad conscious on their shoulders in the movies kind of paints that picture like that we have internal self-talk we have internal dialogue we have internal conflicts um, are they really internal or are they external because the thoughts come from outside of us and it's only an internal conflict once we accept something that maybe doesn't resonate with our programming you know and if we accept something so many times eventually we're going to create programming which is called a habit to be able to work out that that negative or positive thought that we accepted all those times that's how affirmations work you keep saying an affirmation about how you want to become rich over and over again and you're programming your body saying no Corey you're not meant to be rich no Corey you grew up realizing that your parents don't get to be rich and neither do you you grew up believing that the bible said uh, you're never going to be rich or being rich is bad blah 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 but if you keep saying it over and over and over and over again eventually your body is going to have to banish and get rid of the old program and create a new program for it now it would be a hell of a lot faster to do magical ritual um, especially during like a, a waning moon phase to banish out your programming whether it's religious programming or just uh, the fact that you've seen your family cousins aunts uncles grandparents go through poverty all their life well you banish all that out of your head saying that was them and that's not me all that programming was put into my mind against my will without my consent and I now replace it with the programming that I am willing to have a high, uh, high financial set point and am worth more than I make, but I make six figures or something, whatever you want to work it out. Make sure you don't put negative speech in there like I do not accept. It's going to be like, it turns out to be I accept. <laughs> or I do accept, basically. So, but that was the point I wanted to get at, that it was circular. It doesn't matter which starts first. Uh, a lot of people say your emotion dictates your thoughts, and some people say your thoughts dictate your emotion, and I believe it's a circle. I, I use just for example, hypothetical, but spe or speculate, I don't know, maybe I was speculating, it doesn't matter. I use thoughts being first, because, you know, the first law is, a, is mentalism, all is mind, all starts in the mind of God, basically, you know, so... But if you're having negative thoughts coming into your head, okay, you're banishing, you're banishing, but they just keep coming because you're still in that negative state. Well, you can try one of two things. Banish that negative thought and then accept a positive thought. You do that over and over again and maybe that positive thought will finally take and put you into a positive vibration slash emotion or just try to put yourself into a positive emotion. You know, try to go into that meditative state where you're not thinking about anything or you're thinking about just one maybe positive thing, maybe it's a question, whatever it is, one thing. And while you're in there, you're using positive emotions. And by positive, I mean positivity. Anytime I'm saying positive, I mean positivity. I'm not meaning like positive ions or negative ions. Um, it's a mistake I make often, not my spell work, because I always catch it there, but when talking, because a lot of people associate those words, so I use those words, but I shouldn't, because I want to be part of the solution, not the problem. Therefore, I should always explain over and over again the do's and don'ts and why not to do that because you know I could have new listeners listening and being like saying okay I banish negativity and I and I uh, invoke positivity and that'll kill you <laughs> that'll give you a disease and kill you because positive ions are Wi-Fi radiation you know what's coming off the computer screen there's too much sun can give you that you know um, and negative ions are what come from the earth that heal you 
But once again, too many negative ions could probably kill you, just like too many positive ions could kill you. You need to find that balance. Problem is, we are bombarded with positive ions all the time, and we don't get enough negative ions. So therefore, negative ions right now are super, super healthy. But maybe at some point, that paradigm will switch, and the positive ions will be the ones that have to bring us back to balance. Because it's not necessarily just that negative ions are healing ions. Right now they are because we are out of balance with too many positive ions in our body. But that's just a circumstance that's playing out right now. It doesn't actually mean negative ions are healing ions. Both of them can be healing and and damaging. You know, what that which can cure can kill. Right? It's, all, it's all about balance. It all comes down to balance. But anyway, so the point I was trying to get at was to find your purpose. Start small. Start trying to figure out, brainstorm the things you liked as a child, the things you are good at, the things you like doing now. From there, take that list of things that you like doing and you know you can use your conscious mind and try to figure out which ones you would like to do, right? Try not to be impulsive though. Try to do this and like, because you know, sometimes you go on the internet and you see things that you like and be, oh, that would be cool. Like to me, it'd be cool to be a jet pilot. But that's not something I fucking, I, I'm dreaming about or I think my passion is, you know? I'd love to fucking do it. But I don't know if I could do that as a job, you know what I mean? There's a lot of things I'd love to do, but it doesn't mean that's my passion. That's why you don't go with just Venus, and that's why you don't just go with Mars. You go from somewhere between the both. When you find something you're passionate about that you could love to do. It's not just what do I love to do or what I'm passionate about. It's a mixture of both. You know, and I would also take into account that's male and female. You should also take into account your air and your water. Where are those signs in your chart? You know, what's going on there? You know, you're taking a Venus and you're taking a Mars. Well, then you can get to pick the other two. You want to pick the moon or you want to pick Jupiter or you want to pick the sun and uh, or Saturn, you know? You, you know, picking them all, using them all and coming into play would be a great way to look at this. But generally speaking, there are certain houses that deal with what you should do for a living, what you love, and shit like that. And there are certain planets to do that. So if for some reason you're your houses have to do with your job overlap and have the planets in there that have to do with your love and your passion you know what I mean well then it'll be kind of clear cut in your chart what you're supposed to do but if you don't want to go that route that's fine too but you start off the right way get yourself talk under control get your conscious mind under control get your get that link to the subconscious under control so you can ask your subconscious to help reveal to you what you already know but right now isn't clear or you can't figure out. And that is what you should be doing in life. What's your passion? What's your purpose? Because a lot of people just don't ask. They expect to get into this path. They do everything the book says, but they never actually ask the questions they want. They don't actually ask for money or help or healing. They just assume they have it and they keep going along their way and then nothing ever happens and they give up. And that's not what I want anybody to do. So understanding that it's a circle and the best way, you know, Shadow work is dealing with those negative thoughts, okay? So I believe part of shadow work is doing this banish, reject, deny thing. It's kind of something I forgot to say last time. Okay, banish, reject, deny something everybody should be doing all the time. But during your shadow period, you have to embrace and go into the darkness of yourself. Realize how dangerous you can be. Realize what's what's holding you back realize your fears okay because every time a certain time a month or whatever you get to a place where you're you are before this place you're super happy all the time but then all of a sudden you get pretty down on yourself and it's because you're you know you're not dealing with whatever that is whatever that demon is whatever it is you're postponing working on so you just keep putting on stuff that you agree with stuff that you like over and over again and you just try to stay in this positive uh, state which is great you know, if you're having being bombarded with negative thoughts, then yeah, if you, if the only thing you can do or the best thing you can do in that moment, especially if you're somewhere not at home ready to deal with the shadow stuff around your, you know, your kid's baseball or hockey game, then yeah, try to change your emotions so your thoughts change. But once you get home and the kids are in bed and all that, it's time to open up and deal with what's going on. Get to the root of the problem. Let the tears come out. Let 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 yourself be vulnerable. 
you know, you're by yourself, there's nobody else around, and for some reason you can't do that, you just can't do it, you might need to look into some doctor health therapy. Now, I believe in just going on online and using Reiki for certain things like this. Um, like I said before, Luna Inne is the first person I ever went to. There's another man on there, and I can't think of his name, but I'm going to put him on here, or at least put a link on here to, in one of these videos one of these days, so you guys can go check them out. Um, but there's a bunch of different Reiki videos for whatever you want. And some of them are positive, some are negative, some are for sleeping, some of them are for cutting dark shadows, for getting rid of the evil eye, getting rid of uh, uh, attachments and love with other people, stuff like that. So do some of that if you can't afford to go to a shrink. Do some self-hypnosis to relieve some of the issues you have. You know, type in self-hypnosis, whatever it is you think you need to deal with that's part of your shadow work or whatever. Listen to those over and over at night, you know, and then it might be easier for to deal with. Things might come up to the surface and all that. There's a lot of free techniques you can do. All you have to do is brainstorm and figure out what you need to do, you know, because all uh, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists are going to do is ask you all the information surrounding this thing, you know, and they're only going to be able to help you if you're honest. So if you're not honest, you're wasting your money. But if you're not honest, you're better off than just do it by yourself if you're too embarrassed to tell people these things. But they're there to help you and they don't give a shit what you did. Their job is there because they like to fix things. They like to help people and they like to solve puzzles. So don't be embarrassed about what puzzle you're giving them. If you think it's weird and you think it's something you never heard of, odds are they have to some extent have already dealt with that. And if they haven't, it's going to be great for them because they're going to be so motivated to help you and so into it. So... I would get rid of that reservations. Now, I'm sure there's exceptions to the rules. I'm sure there's some psycholo psychologists, psychiatrists that are doing it that realize it wasn't their passion, but they're too lazy or too, you know, scared to try something else. You know, they got to pay their bills. But if you find you have somebody like that, well, then just switch, you know. Yeah, it'll suck if you had to pay an additional amount for your, you know, your consultation, but and then have to do it again. But don't stay with somebody you don't resonate with, you know. Take the laws, do some Reiki things, do some self-hypnosis things, read a couple books about psychology, psychiatry, self-hypnosis. I put a bunch of self-hypnosis or hypnosis books on the last video I put out. Uh, some of them are hypnosis and LP. I think I put about five books there. So go check that out. It's going to be pretty good and helpful for you. But yeah, so I think the banishing, rejecting, and denying thing is a huge part of the shadow work, and it's very beneficial. But... I'm not telling you to ever accept your negative thoughts, but by having these negative thoughts come over and over again, maybe write them down and then banish them. Write them down and then banish them. And then when you're in this place to be able to, no one's around, and you can actually dig into why is this thought banishing? Why is this thought that I have to keep rejecting, denying, and banishing? Why does it keep coming up? What is it tied to? It's a good question to meditate on, you know? And then from there, you can start digging into your own dark psyche. And that's, truth be told, that, that's, that's one of the reasons this is probably happening. You know, one of the reasons we banish, reject these thoughts is because we're trying to organize it. You know, your subconscious mind picks up everything and it's picking up these things. Whether it knows if it's good or bad, it's, I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think it does know the difference between good and bad, to be honest. I think it's only us. And I think good and bad depends on the person, you know, your own personal scale of good and bad. But I think it just, because the subconscious is kind of connected with everybody. So, so everybody has a different view of good and bad, first of all. Um, something... You know, somebody who likes kids, that's going to be good. Somebody who doesn't like kids, well, having kids would be bad. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So our subconscious are all linked because that's our link to the divine. So technically, our, our subconscious mind is like the divine mind as well. It's not the universal unconscious. That's kind of a different thing. But our, our, our subconscious minds or unconscious minds are all kind of connected to each other. That's how we perform magic perform magic by affecting our subconscious mind which internally affects all the other subconscious mind closest to you and then it affects change through that whether you're trying to get money and I use that person from the Brinks truck leaving 30 grand on top of the Brinks truck you know got a phone call from his wife whatever buddy forgot to come in and check the next person went in never looked up you know all these things happen because their subconscious mind made sure that no one else that guy didn't remember he left 30 grand there the other guy didn't go check the next person in there didn't look up and it wasn't until the person that was meant to grab it for whatever reason found it you know what I mean so so this vanish deny reject is super uber important now, once you get past there and you start having ideas, you know, asking questions, pointing it down before you go to bed, all the things you think might be your passion and asking which one of these would be the best for me to start with. 
or how can I do something I'm passionate about? What do I need to do to help my passion? Well, if you figure out what your passion is, okay, well, then you need to figure out what steps you need to take to accomplish becoming and doing your passion uh, to provide service to others or whatever the case may be, or if that's even an option. So you need to start asking questions to that effect or doing sigils or doing candle magic to that effect, you know? And the littler the spells are, the more easier they'll manifest for you. And then you'll have something to see if it works or not, you know? I think this is why, though, you don't do manifestations or not supposed to during your initial neophyte grade because you can be very impulsive and try to go for the gusto, the big fucking money, when really you should be casting for a way to continuously receive money, you know, for a business, for a specific job, for for something artistic or something that is unique to you, you know what I mean? And then the money will just come, you know, and then you know, just ask it for money. You've got something that's sustainable and you can continue to get money, but it's circular. I believe the thoughts are spirits that are around us, you know, we pick them up depending on if we're in positive or a negative vibration, you know, whether hey, I used a metaphor or the similar, the simile AM and FM, AM being negative and FM being positive, or you can do vice versa. So if you're on AM, well, you're not going to get FM stations. FM stations would be the thoughts that are around you, you know, but once you put on the FM station or FM setting, then all the FM stations can come in. Now, depending on how far the radio station is, some will come in. If you drive towards them, some of them won't come in at all. You only get the local ones. And that's kind of how magic works. Whenever you're, if you want something big, well, you need to put forth more action. So you kind of have to drive closer to that town where that radio station is broadcast. That's putting forth the action. Now, if you're doing something small, then you probably won't have to do much action whatsoever and it still will come to you. But if you're in that AM vibration and you're trying to get an a FM affirmation slash magic to work for you, well, it's not going to come in. So you need to banish those thoughts, reject, deny those thoughts and come into a happy vibration. The longer you can be in the same vibrational emotion that your manifestation is, then the faster you'll get it. Now, Freder Xavier talks about having to be able to have the form because you can fake force. Force and form are the two things you need to have. One is pretending to be in the emotion of winning whatever it is you're winning, seeing it, visualizing it, and all that. Um, so uh, that to me is a little, you know, because I was, I know, I, I, I act as if I already have it and I use emotions like when I'm very happy or teared up from a movie or whatever the case is throughout my day. If anything gets me a little choked up and I'm very emotional but happy, I, and I start thinking about my, my manifestation and it generally works and it's not necessarily tied to the same thing but I'm still in a very happy uh, uh, emotional state. And, you know, that magnetism, that my heart, the electromagnetism, that my heart's pumping, you know, it's pulling my thing towards me, you know, like a magnet pulls whatever it wants or it pushes away if it's the magnet of the same thing. But anyways, so I think that's going to be enough for today. I just wanted to reiterate that it's so circle, right? The thoughts that you pick up and you accept or deny, you know, either go back into your subconscious or that you... You consciously accept them and then you're going to start playing it out basically. But it all comes from the stuff you've seen from a child to right up to now. And the order they come out, I don't know. I can't tell you that. But what I can tell you is if you have old programming in you that you haven't got rid of yet, then you're going to keep having thoughts that are in line with that. So the faster you get rid of that programming, the faster you won't have to banish those thoughts over and over and over and over and over and over again. You know, it can be kind of tedious. So work smarter not harder and that's kind of what i want to say here anyways i'm going to go to the jordan peterson clip thing um bunch of pdfs about him are going to be on there plus the gulag archipelago i hope everybody enjoyed have a great fucking day summation of the world situation and really the world psychological situation at the end of the 1800s and that was that our new modes of thinking had undermined our faith in our old modes of thinking, and that was a problem because people need something firm to stand on to orient themselves and to move forward. And so Nietzsche and Dostoevsky basically both prophesied that the consequence of that dissolution would be 
um, increased probability of nihilism and everything that went along with that. Dostoevsky wrote about that actually quite extensively in a book called Notes from Underground, which if any of you are interested, especially in clinical psychology, that's a book you should really read because it's one of the most brilliant psychological studies of a, of a, of a psychologically disturbed man that's ever been written. It's very accurate. And there are sections in Crime and Punishment that are like that too. I think they're unsurpassed in their representation of, of, of psychological phenomena. I don't, I don't know how he managed it. I mean, Dostoevsky was epileptic. I don't know if you can know that, but he, um, he was arrested by the Tsar's men in the late 1800s for being a student radical. And uh, they threw him in that main prison in, in Moscow. And then one day they took him out in front of a firing squad and shot him at six in the morning, but they only used blanks, which of course he didn't know about. And that scared him so badly he developed epilepsy and then he had epilepsy. That can happen, by the way. Um, and then he had epilepsy for the rest of his life, but he had this strange kind of epilepsy, which is actually not all that rare. Um, sometimes when people have epilepsy, they, they experience this phenomena they call an aura, which is an altered state of consciousness before the epileptic seizure hits. And they can be very strange, these auras. So I read a case study once about a guy who, um, his aura was that his hand was being possessed by devils from hell. And he could feel the possession move up his arm and into his shoulder. And once it hit his head, he'd have an epileptic seizure. And so then uh, there was another case um, where, where this man... His aura was that his exact double had appeared behind him. But if he turned, and if he turned to look, then he'd have an epileptic seizure. But if he didn't turn to look, then he wouldn't. So these, you know, brain disorders are very strange things because they're, well, the system that is disordered is alive and it's capable of any number of extraordinarily peculiar misbehaviors. Anyways, Dostoevsky's aura was a world-revealing aura. And so what Dostoevsky would experience was that the meaning of things got deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then just as he was on the verge of discovering the secret to everything, he'd have an epileptic seizure. But he said that the quality of experience during the aura was so high, so overpowering and so deep that he would have traded all of his normal experience just to have had those experiences. And he had them repeatedly. And I really do believe that it was this broadening of his of his vision and concept by his epilepsy that transformed him, among other things. I mean, he went through some pretty damn rough experiences because he was in prison with rapists and murderers for a long time in Siberia, even though he was kind of an aristocratic guy. I mean, he had a, he had a rough time of it. And I, I imagine that that also broadened him tremendously, given that it didn't kill him. But uh, I really do believe that the epileptic insight was key to his, like, his unsurpassed genius. And so, and the, his aura, and other people do experience epileptic aura symptoms like that, by the way, and some people are so enamored of the aura that they won't take their anti-epilepsy medication because they don't want to forego the experience that precedes the aura or the actual, actual epileptic seizure. So Dostoevsky's experiences, the, the awe element of the aura, is also relevant to what we're going to talk about today because... Both Binswanger and, and Boss were very interested in how meaning revealed itself in the world. And they had, an, they had opposing explanations. I actually think they're parallel explanations. But um, the meaning that Dostoevsky experienced is, is an amplification of the normal manner in which meaning reveals itself in the world. So, I mean, and, and people experience that sort of thing in, in various altered states of consciousness. Anyways, Binswanger and Boss, so they worked mostly in the 1950s, and as I said, they were very concerned about what had happened in World War II, and so Dostoevsky and Nietzsche had basically predicted that it was going to be nihilism or ideological totalitarianism, and that's basically exactly what happened. And by, by the time the 1930s appeared on the horizon, the Germans had been, you know, they'd gone through an absolutely brutal First World War, and then they went through hyperinflation of insane proportions. So in the 1920s, Germany underwent this partly because they had such heavy war debts to pay for World War I. The German, German inflation got to the point where it, it was literally upwards of 100 million marks to buy a loaf of bread. You know, so they were taking wheelbarrows full of money to the, 
grocery stores. You know, what happened was their currency devalued to zero. And, you know, that actually happens to economies more often than you might think. So the thing just hits zero, and that's that. And then it has to be rebooted, so to speak. So they had been, the war was dreadful. And hundreds of thousands of men were killed or brutalized. Then their economy just absolutely fell apart. And then, of course, at the same time, well, a little bit earlier, the revolution had taken place in Russia, right, you know, right at the end of the First World War, and the communists had come to power, and the communists were agitating all over Europe and in North America, and you know, their goal was to to produce a communist revolution that was worldwide, and so the Germans were all shorted out that the communists were going to take over the country, which was a perfectly reasonable fear, and you know, instead of that, what happened was that. Fascism arose, and fascism was a form of, of state totalitarianism. And I think the Germans were so desperate for order by that point that, and that's what the fascists basically offered them, at least in theory. Um, unfortunately, as it turned out, they offered them a little bit too much order, or maybe a lot too much order, and things went dreadfully south. But you know, so then the whole world had to walk through the horrors of World War II, and and it was shocking in a variety of ways, not only because of the brutality of the warfare, but because of the genocidal actions that took place consciously by the Nazis. And, you know, and those actions were, in many ways, very difficult to understand. Um, I mean, and here's why they're particularly difficult to understand. There, there were certainly times where the brutality that the Nazis employed in their eradication of their theoretical enemies far surpassed the necessity for the mere eradication, but even worse than that. So it went past eradication into real torture constantly. And not only that, there are many situations in which the Nazis, especially near the end of the war, they had to decide really whether they were going to continue exterminating Jews and gypsies and homosexuals and all the people they felt didn't fit into their culture, or whether they were going to win the war. And there were decisions they had to make about the distribution of resources, where if they were going to per pursue the genocidal extermination, that would mean it would decrease the probability that they would win the war. And that happened a lot, especially at the end, and the Nazis always picked continuing the extermination. Now, that's pretty damn interesting, you know, because you can think, well, on the one hand, you know, if, if they are serving a creed, and the creed is world domination, and this is the extermination processes are considered a step towards the actual end point, which is the establishment of a world state, a fascist world state, or at least a fascist European state, then you would think that the extermination attempts would be subordinate to that goal if they were actually pursuing the goal that they said they were pursuing. But, you know, there's an old psychoanalytic idea which is really worthwhile. It's like a surgical tool, and I would say if you're going to use it in your own life, use it carefully because you don't want to do unnecessary surgery. And the rule is and I think this is a union rule, but I can't remember exactly where I read it. If you can't understand why someone is doing something, look at the consequences of their actions, whatever those might be, and then infer the motivation from the consequences. So if you see someone who seems to be doing nothing except making everyone around them and themselves miserable, and you can't understand why, one of the hypotheses that you might entertain is that they're trying to make everyone around them miserable as well as themselves, and that's actually their goal. And it's hard for people to understand these sorts of things, because when we see phenomena like the Columbine shooters, you know, we always assume that the reason that these people are doing these sorts of things is for other reasons than the reasons they that the reasons that appear to motivate them, or even the reasons they say they're doing it, because the Columbine killer, especially the more literate one, he said exactly why he was doing what he was doing. It's, it's as clear as it could possibly be. All you have to do is go online and read what he said, and he tells you what he was up to. But people don't like to think that way because they don't believe that anybody could be consciously possessed of that much malevolence without there being some other kind of cause, like, you know, he was bullied at school, or, you know, he was an outcast, and those things were only vaguely true, and they certainly weren't more true of him than they were true of, you know, how many people in high school are, you know, bullied and somewhat outcast. Jesus, it must be 10%, it's probably more like 30. You know, that doesn't mean that the schools are blowing up all over, you know, all over all the time. It's a completely insufficient explanation. Anyways, for whatever reason, you know, 
people turn to possession by very, very strict ideological ideas. And, you know, they were willing to be possessed by those ideas to the point where they would undertake actions that you'd think would be completely impossible for theoretically civilized people. You know, turned out that those actions not only were not impossible for civilized people, but that the people themselves, you know, especially in Nazi Germany, they pretty much knew what the hell was going on, you know. You don't take several million people out of your population without rumors spreading, let's say. And so, you know, we should never forget that Hitler was elected, you know, and he was elected by a large majority, too. It was a landslide vote, the kind of vote that no modern democratic leader ever gets. So, you know, although it's difficult to, it's difficult for people to swallow, um, it's hard not to assign culpability for what happened in Germany to the society at every strata. You can't just dump it on the leaders. And in fact, one of the things, here's, here's something to think about with regards to Hitler. So because one of the things you might ask is, how the hell could he be so, so absolutely compelling to his audiences? But here, here I'll give you an explanation. So let's, let's, make the, let's make a few assumptions. And the first assumption is, there are a lot of resentful Germans kicking around. Why? Well, they lost the First World War. That wasn't so good. And then there were a lot of brutal men left because they'd been in the trenches and they'd been shooting, fighting and shooting at each other under absolutely abhorrent conditions for, like, years and years. And so there were plenty of brutalized men around. Um, and then their whole damn economy collapsed because they were forced into signing what historians regard as a very punitive peace treaty. And so, like... Everything had fallen apart to a degree that we can't even begin to imagine. And so, you know, in the 1930s, the Germans were starting to get back on their feet. And, and um, when Hitler came to power, he started not only to rearm, but to reindustrialize the economy. And he was actually pretty damn good at that. So now Hitler was a good orator, but he, but he, it isn't exactly clear that he was a uh, coherent philosophical theorizer, although to think of him as stupid is, is completely missing the point. He was by no means stupid. Um, I wouldn't say that he was particularly educated, but he had a very powerfully developed aesthetic sense, and he spent a lot of his time designing the cities that would be built after World War II was over, and those cities were generally conceptualized by him as places where the arts, or at least the Nazi version of the arts, could flourish. You know, So there's no real evidence that what was wrong with the Nazis was that they weren't civilized. There's more evidence, actually, I think, that they were too civilized. And I'll talk to you about that later. But anyways, you think, how did Hitler get all these people under his spell? Well, here's a hypothesis that's basically derived from Jungian thinking. And I shouldn't let you know, by the way, because sometimes Jung has been accused of being an anti-Semite. And there's various reasons for this, partly because of what happened during World War II, and partly because... Um, his theory drew heavily from Christianity, although from many other sources as well. And he did believe that there were differences in the psychology of people with different ethnicities. And now, you know, whether that's racist or not depends on whether or not you like the person you're talking to. Because the lefties think that there are cultural differences and they're important. But if you ever talk about them in the wrong way, then you're racist. And the right-wingers, well, they just think there are ethnic differences to begin with. So it's a tricky it's a tricky issue. If there aren't differences that are important, then who the hell cares about multiculturalism? It's not even worth preserving. And if there are differences, well, then you're stuck with having to deal with the differences. So you're basically screwed either way. So anyways, Jung has been the target of many accusations of anti-Semitism, particularly by biographers who were resentful and clueless and historically uninformed and... Um, I would say malevolent, fundamentally. Um, he worked as a CIA agent. It was just revealed last year. He, he, he provided psychological reports to the American government on the underlying psychological structure of the Nazi leaders for years. And he never told anybody about that while he was alive. It only came to light, like it only came to light, as far as I know, last year, or perhaps a year before that. So... So anyways, the Germans, you know, they weren't very happy about the whole damn situation. And so when they were aggregating en masse, you think, well, what happens when all people get together in a group? You know, we talked about that last time when we talked about Kierkegaard's idea that as soon as you get a bunch of people together, no matter how truthful they are all as individuals, instantly the crowd is not a truthful thing. And, you know, there, there, there are 
There are real reasons for that, real psychological reasons. So there's the famous ASH experiments. I hope that those are the right experiments, A-S-C-H, about line length, you know. So you draw two lines on the board, and they're the same length, and you get the, the crowd to, you know, collaborate with you, and you ask some poor sucker who doesn't know about the game uh, to play, and, you know, you ask one person, and they say, no, those lines are different in length. And you ask another person, they say, well, they're quite different in length. And another person says... Yeah, sure, I can see the difference in length. And then you ask the poor pigeon, you know, are they different in length? And he says, yes, you know, and you can understand why. It's like if all those other people are saying it, there's either, there's either something wrong with all of them, which seems unlikely, or he's the victim of a conspiracy, which is a little on the paranoid side, but happens to actually be true in this case, um, or... He's just not looking at it right. And you might think, well, the humble thing to think is he's wrong. And so, you know, the fact that somebody might go along with the crowd, you know, you can, you can, you can blame that on their, on their ability to be social and conventional, which in many ways is a huge advantage. Because if you are all antisocial and unconventional, you know, I mean, there'd be a good chunk of you in jail and we certainly wouldn't be having this, you know, delightful, peaceful conversation that we're having. So, you know, you don't want to underestimate the utility of conventionality to too much of a degree. Anyway, so there's this funny story I read once. I don't think it's true, but it might be. Where a psychology class got together and decided they'd play a trick on the professor. And the trick was that he would walk back and forth, eh? And, and the trick was that they wouldn't pay any attention to him at all if he was on the left side of the room. You know, they'd talk a bit and look look up. And if he was on the right side of the room, then they'd really focus in and pay attention. And the story goes that by the, you know, by several weeks of this little trick, they had him, like, lecturing right beside the door, you know, and he wouldn't move from that spot. And so the reason I'm telling you that is because it's pretty obvious that people can respond to the cues that a crowd is delivering. You know, and a good speaker does that. So a good speaker does a variety of things. And one is they never talks to the, to the crowd per se. You know, you pick out specific individuals and talk to them and they're sort of reflective of the crowd. And then you can tell if everybody's understanding. And uh, the other thing that a good speaker does is the damn responses of the crowd. Because, you know, if, if a lecture is really a dialogue, even though the, the audience is only emitting nonverbal, the nonverbal elements of the conversation, those nonverbal elements, those damn things are important. So you want to stay in touch with the nonverbal communications. Now, Hitler, he's kind of a chaotic guy, you know. He's very angry. He's angry in part because he was a frustrated art student. He tried to get into art school like four times. So really the person to blame for World War II was the four-person committee that wouldn't let poor Hitler into the, I believe it was the Viennese School of Art, because he really wanted to go. You know, and he had some artistic talent. He was a little on the conventional side by all appearances, but, you know, I've seen some of his sketches, and, you know, he wasn't a complete piker, and he kind of felt maybe it would be okay for him to go to university, because he'd just been through World War One, you know, and that wasn't much fun. There's a story about Hitler where he was out on, in the trenches, and he was there with all his buddies, and he wandered off to do whatever he wandered off to do, and when he came back, they were all dead because a bomb had landed right in the middle of them. And, you know, you might think that would do a little something to your psyche because after an experience like that, you're either going to think, oh, man, things are pretty damn random and horrible, or there's, pretty, there's something pretty damn special about me because I wasn't killed by the bomb, you know. Maybe God has saved me for a higher purpose. I mean, you can be, be absolutely sure that if you went through an experience like that, that something like that would be rattling around in your mind. And he won a, he won a medal for bravery. You know, so he kind of, and then he, after World War I, he kind of wandered around like a lot of men, unemployed and sort of like a tramp, you know. So he wasn't very happy about that, and, and you know, no wonder. So anyways, he didn't get into art school. Now, he didn't really have a fully developed political theory, you know, and, but he was pretty good at speaking. So, and there were lots of people who had come to, to, to hear him speak because people were sort of trying to figure out what the hell to do about all the chaos, you know. So then you think, well, what, did Hitler, what was Hitler good at? Well, okay, now I'm going to switch to a slightly different story, and then I'll get back to this one. So I don't know if you know, guys know about the, uh, the daycare scandals that, that were very, very common in the 1980s. So 
horribly common, actually, and this infested many towns. And usually what would happen is somebody who is a little on the paranoid side, or maybe a lot on the paranoid side, would send their children off to daycare. And that was a whole new thing in the 80s, right? Because women were, you know, moving into the workforce like mad, and so they were handing over their, often their infants, kids below three, say, to total strangers. And, you know, for some of them, that set up a fair bit of worry, like it still does. And sometimes that worry got out of hand, especially among the people who are a little on the little predisposed to paranoid schizophrenia, and maybe even had had some previous episodes. And so, you know, the kid would come home and the mother would observe, or not, something kind of peculiar about their behavior, and then she'd fantasize about maybe what that was, and then, you know, she'd start asking the child if the child had been touched in any particular way, and, you know, and she'd keep this up for a good length of time, and then the child would start to have nightmares, and then the child would tell the mother about what the nightmares were, and then that would freak her out, and so she'd ask even deeper questions, and soon, you know, her children were telling her that horrible things were happening to them at daycare. And so then she'd go to the police, and they would look into her psychiatric background, and then the police would go out and they'd start to interview other children. And if they interviewed them properly, then the other children would start to produce all these stories as well. Because the Now, how did that happen? Well, a bunch of ways. The first is, the police would ask leading questions, like, did anyone touch you? Well, of course, someone touched the kids. I mean, people touch kids. Did anybody touch you there? Well, that's not a question. That's a piece of information. The piece of information is, if someone touched me there, an adult would be very interested in that, right? So now, what's a child doing when he's answering an adult's questions? Well, the child doesn't bloody well know. What the hell do they know? They're like three, you know? They can hardly organize their story. You know, if you're talking to a kid and you want to give, get them to give you an account of their day... You have to really guide them through the organization of their memory. And partly what they're doing when you're doing that is they're looking at you, trying to figure out if they're telling you the right things, which is what they should be doing, because what they're trying to learn to do is to tell people things in a way that they'll understand them. But that makes the child very, very responsive to the nonverbal and verbal cues of the adult. You think about how fast those little rats learn how to pick up language, you know. It's really very fast, and no one really teaches them. They're just paying attention like that. So you get a bunch of c- cops who are on a, like a half-cocked adventure, and they think there's some serial sexual pervert in their midst, and they go interview, you know, 15, 20 kids, and they do, a, do, do, a, do it a lot. They use little dolls, and they do it a lot, and they do it a lot, and they do it a lot. And sooner or later, all the kids start having nightmares, and then they start telling the cops there's all these terrible things happen, like they're taken into underground caverns, and they're stripped naked, and they're forced to, like, leapfrog over each other, and, like, you just can't believe it, what happened. You can't believe it. It's all documented in a book called Satan's Silence, which was written by a social worker and a lawyer. It's mind-boggling. The longest prison sentences in American history were handed out to a, to a series of middle-aged women who were taking care of little kids. And the FBI even came up with a whole new criminal category. Late-onset female sexual offender. Well, why didn't that category exist before? It's simple. There are no late-onset middle-aged female sexual offenders. That's why we didn't need the category. But once all these accusations came up, well, poof, you know, you had to have some damn category for these poor women. Some of them were put in jail for 350 years, which seems a bit excessive, given that they're only going to last about 40. You know, they get 12 consecutive life sentences. So, and, you know, there was a, actually a situation where one town went so far as to start digging underneath the town to find these underground satanic lairs where all these weird ritual things were going on. You know, and along with this was not one shred of, collab- of, of concrete evidence. You know, and the eventual conclusions, of, and this affected thousands of people, the eventual conclusions was, well, there, there actually isn't anybody who's, you know, satanically uh, torturing children in daycare centers. Now, now, anyways, why am I telling you this? Well... What the children were doing, you think about it, how the hell did the children come up with these weird ideas? You know, I mean, first of all, we should note that children are not stupid. And they can also dream up the most horrible things, you know, um, because they have an imagination that's capable of, 
extending itself out into the terrifying. Now, everyone knows that because all you have to do is remember when you were a kid, and, you know, when you were hiding under the covers because there were horrible things in your dark room. You know, you can populate the darkness with monsters with no problem. And you should be able to because there are monsters in the darkness, even though your parents might tell you there aren't. It's like there might not be any dark monsters in that particular piece of darkness. And that's a perfectly reasonable thing to tell your children. But in the darkness as a whole, it's like, yeah, look the hell out. So the children aren't stupid. Now, so then the, the, the adults start to question them and the kids are... The back of their brain, the little imaginary pushy, 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 pushy. What do these people want? What do these people want? What do these people want? And so they'll throw them out a little bit of information, and they'll, the adults will perk up. They'll focus right on that piece of information. So maybe it's a cop who really hates child Satanist abductors, which, you know, is a perfectly reasonable stance. And so when the child offers any information about, about the existence of such a thing, well, the cop will perk up. And then the child thinks, oh, I see, well, so sort of what's going on seems to have something to do. They don't think this consciously, you know, but their imagination is working. How do I model the reality that's being presented to me? And that's when the dreams start to kick in, too. Okay. So, by speaking in the appropriate way, you get all sorts of things churned up in, in the in the unconscious minds of your listeners. And by watching them as well, you can extract out their unconscious desires. So now, I'm speaking to you all, and you're all irritated because your life has been really awful for 15 years. And I'm saying this, and I'm saying that, and I'm saying this, and I'm saying that. You know, and then I say something, maybe I say something... uh, Initially, uh, dismissive of Jews. And you're all mad. And there's two or three people who go, yeah. And then I think, oh, you know, that's kind of an interesting response. And then, you know, I lay out a couple more ideas, and some of them don't get any response. And others, you know, people perk right up. And, and I'm not stupid, and I'm trying to get the bloody attention of the crowd. And so if I do that 50 times... The crowd's going to tell me an awful lot about what they want, especially if I'm willing to follow them. And I can do that easily because, especially if I can start to work the crowd a little bit, because I can capitalize on their emotional, on their emotional, capitalize on their emotions and the display of that emotion. And I can learn to play that. And then that turns into a positive feedback loop. And so Hitler's informing the audience and the audience is informing Hitler. And that's why Jung believes that Hitler embodied the shadow of the German people. So that's another reason why you should be careful what you say, and why you say it, you know, and why you're looking for attention, and all of those things, and actually what's motivating you, and actually what's motivating the people who are listening to you. Because God only knows where it might go if you're not careful. Well, actually, we do know where it goes if you're not careful, and it's not pretty, that's for sure. And to think that we've learned anything from that, it's like, no, that, that's not right. We haven't learned a damn thing from it. So, because we don't want to understand it. Now, these guys were all concerned with that sort of thing. They were highly concerned with it. Now, Ben Swanger and Boss had both been influenced by Freud and by you. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner there, that's uh, Boss with you. And, and that's Ben Swanger on the left and Boss at the top there. So, you know, they're, they're pretty thoughtful-looking guys, and they were pretty damn smart. And they were quite philosophically oriented, and... They had both studied Heidegger, and they both studied Husserl, who were German philosophers. Uh, Heidegger actually got tangled right up in, into the Nazi movement, and you know his philosophy has been cast under a cloud of suspicion, perhaps a well-deserved cloud of suspicion, as a consequence of his cooperation with the Nazis. So it wasn't only stupid people who got tangled up in this. It was pretty much everybody who got tangled up in it. And one of the things you might, be, might think about, and this is worth thinking about, is that if you were there, for any one of you, there's a 90% chance that you would have got tangled up in it. You, know, you wouldn't have been the person who rescued the gypsies. It's like, forget that. It's like, unless you think that you know, you're heroic far beyond the average, and I would be very, very careful about assuming that. You could assume instead that you would have been swept along with the crowd just like everyone else. 
because everyone else was. All right. Now, part of what these guys were trying to figure out is, in some sense, there were two things. There was the, the, the function and structure of belief systems, and then the nature of that which transcends a belief system. Okay, so, you know, what transcends a belief system is what you don't know if you use that belief system, right? Because there are things outside of your belief system, and they have a nature as well. And you usually run into those sorts of things when you make a mistake. And things don't happen the way you expect them to or want them to or desire them to. So, and then the other problem they're trying to solve in some sense is, well, what's the appropriate mode of behavior for an individual in relationship to belief systems and to the world that transcends the belief systems? And the reason they were interested in that is because they thought, well, maybe it would be a good, good idea if our belief systems didn't get so damn pathological. Because if they do, then, you know, 6 million people end up in ovens or the equivalent, and 120 million people end up dead in battlefields. And, you know, that doesn't count the Stalin massacres or Mao, who were, you know, made Hitler in some sense look like an absolute amateur. I mean, Stalin starved 6 million people to death in the Ukraine in the 1930s. And he was just warming up. You know, I don't know how many, how many of you have heard of the Ukraine famine? How many of you haven't? Yeah, well, think about that. You know, how many of you knew Mao killed 100 million people? How many of you didn't? Yeah, well, you might think about why you don't know that. You know, you know about the damn Nazis, but you don't know about the horrors that the communists perpetrated. It's worth thinking about why. Because the communists, especially the Maoist man, those people were brutal. So it's really important, like, of all the things we could possibly learn psychologically from the 20th century, is what these characters in the 50s were concentrating on. It's like, okay, things can go powerfully sideways. It was quite a shock to everyone because in some sense, you know, everyone was pretty thrilled at the beginning of the 19th century that religion, classical religion beliefs, had crumbled. You know, the Marxists said, well, damn religions were only there to oppress the poor anyways and to keep the priesthood and the aristocracy in power. You know, you'll, I'm sure you learned plenty of that in your in your classes, that sort of thinking, you know, it's power economics related thinking, and it's typical of, of, of what, what would you say? Um, I got a heater on in here, but I don't think it's that. Intellectually it's manipulated left wing something. thinkers, I would say, that's basically, Hard to believe, though, that you, you know, they reduce the everything to a single damn motivation, it's usually economics or power, then they explain everything from that perspective, it's like, it's so boneheaded, it should be illegal. Anyways, The Marxists were happy that religion had collapsed because they thought that that would eliminate an, an entire strata of oppression. And you can see that. that. It's not like the Catholic Church, for example, was free of corruption. You know, it was in many ways a corrupt enterprise. And you could read it as solely a corrupt enterprise. And, you know, to hell with it. It's good that it's gone. And, uh, you know, the Freudians basically thought the same way, and so did most intellectuals. Freud thought that religion was nothing than a than a childish delusion that people I cut my hair, so let me know identified with because shame. they were afraid of dying. It was a, a you know it was a defense against death anxiety. Look, the Marxist argument and the and the Freudian argument, those are bloody powerful arguments, you know, because you can see it. Do, do people use their religious belief as a defense against things they're too terrified to confront? No, well, obviously. You know, does the church oppress people or sees with people in power across centuries? It's like obviously, you know the question is, well, what do you make of that? Well, partly you make of it that all sorts of structures do that. It's like structures do that. And, you know, you can't just damn one structure and think the others are going to, you know, it's like the right-wingers, they're always on about big government. Big corporations are terrible. It's like, well, big is terrible. Because they were afraid of dying. It was a, a you know, it was a defense against death anxiety. Look, the Marxist argument and the, and the Freudian argument, those are bloody powerful arguments, you know, because you can see it. Do, do people use their religious belief as a defense against things they're too terrified to confront? No, well, obviously. You know, does the church oppress people? Did it oppress people? Did it engage in, you know, conspiracies with people in power across centuries? It's like, obviously. You know, the question is, well, what do you make of that? Well, partly you make of it that all sorts of structures do that. It's like structures do that. And, you know, you can't just damn one structure and think the others are going to, 
know, it's like the right wingers, they're always on about big government, how terrible that is. And the left wingers are always on about how big corporations are terrible. It's like, well, big is terrible. It doesn't matter if it's government or corporations because things tend to tilt towards corruption across time. And that has to be taken into account. But anyway, so the Freudians and the intellectuals and the Marxists were all pretty happy when the religious dream started to come apart. And they believed that the new edifices that they were going to construct, fascist and communist, would be so much better than what they replaced that, you know, everybody would be drowning in utopia. And, uh... That didn't work. It's kind of too bad that isn't how it turned out. <laughs> but it's certainly not how it turned out. How it turned out was... Mm, sometimes when you tear something down, even if you think it's terrible, you end up constructing something on its ruins that makes the previous terrible look like the work of ranked amateurs. And that's certainly what happened in the 20th century. I mean, no matter what you say about the Catholic Church and its basic barbarism, especially when, you know, they were involved in the witch hunt in the Middle Ages, it's like, those guys, they are amateurs compared to the fascists and the communists. You know, they were counting their victims in the tens of thousands, not the hundreds of millions. So anyways, things didn't go so well. And so by the 1950s, especially because the Cold War started the day the Second World War ended, right? And it ended with the atomic bomb in Japan. And the Russians had the damn atomic bomb, like, you know, tomorrow, fundamentally. And both the Russians and the Americans had the hydrogen bomb by the early 1950s. And I don't know if you know this. You can tell me how many of you know this. Do you know that a hydrogen bomb uses an atom bomb for its trigger? Okay. So the hydrogen bombs, the atom bomb stands in relationship to a hydrogen bomb, like the ignition cap on a shell stands in relationship to the gunpowder. The atomic blast just gets the explosion going. So hydrogen bombs, they're like way, way more explosive than atomic bombs. And so, you know, by the middle of the 1950s, we pretty much put ourselves in a position where, and they were building some mighty big bombs. I mean, really unbelievable unbelievably big bombs, you know, 400 times as big as the ones that wiped out Hiroshima. Like huge, huge bombs. And they were getting pretty damn good at it, you know. So by the mid-1950s, it was like, we developed enough firepower on both sides of the Atlantic, along with the missiles necessary to deliver them, which the Nazis had basically invented in World War II, right? It was all Nazi scientists who invented rockets, and they were all taken by the Americans after the Second World War to work on the American space program, basically. And so by the 1950s, we had the missiles to deliver the damn things, too. So not only were the psychologists who were thinking about things sort of shorted out about what happened in World War II for good reason, and then, of course, all the Stalinist horrors were starting to be revealed at that point, although it took Western intellectuals like 30 years before they gave them any credence at all. I think Jean-Paul Sartre was still a member of the Communist Party up until 1970. It was very common, particularly among French intellectuals. You know, even though the news was getting out, well, careful observers like George Orwell had pretty much figured out by the by the late 30s, that not all was right in the paradise of Stalin, but, you know, people didn't thought he was a right-winger and didn't listen to him much, even though he was a left-winger. So these, these existential phenomenologists, they're trying to figure out, okay, we've got a big problem here. The belief systems are seriously going sideways, and there's some indication... You know, there's some individual responsibility for that of some indeterminate nature. Like, if you live in a country where everyone's turned into a fascist murderer, like, is that your fault? Well, you know, it's not obvious that an individual should be held responsible for the actions of an entire country. But then again, the country's made up of individuals. So it's a very difficult problem to solve. You know, and one of the tenets of Western law is that you don't hold an individual responsible for the actions of the group, even if he or she happens to be a member, willingly or unwillingly, of that group. But you can't ignore the fact that all these things were made up of people. And then you also can't ignore the fact that it was individuals who were doing the terrible things that were being done to people. You know, So in Auschwitz, for example, one of the little tricks that the guards used to do was to, you know, they bring the Jews off the freight cars, a lot of them had died in the freight cars because they were packed in there like this, you know, so lots of them would suffocate or the old ones would die or the little kids would die. And that was okay. 
you know, and then on, on the outside of the freight cars, especially if it was winter, well, it's like 20 below, and so the ones on the outside would freeze, but, you know, we were going to get rid of them anyway, so that was just convenient mostly, so then you'd take them to Auschwitz, and they'd all spill out, speaking different languages, torn up from their family, you know, as miserable as people can possibly be, and then one trick was to have, you know, someone who was not quite dead enough pick up a sack of a wet a sack of wet salt so that's a hundred pounds and carry it from one side of the compound to the other and then back you know one side and then back and you know you don't want to be thinking about these camps as like like a football field these bloody things were cities they were big they held tens of thousands of people and so there's some guard he thinks that's a pretty good joke and it's not just a few people that are like that. And we found out from the Stanford Prison Experiment, which every psychologist likes to think of as immoral, you know, because we actually discovered something with it, that if you gave ordinary people the opportunity to be fascist barbarians in six days, 30% of them would be. And, you know, what we learned from that is that social psychologists shouldn't run the Stanford Prison Experiment. That's not the right conclusion to draw. So... So these phenomenologists are all, we're all concerned about this. It's like, what the hell should we do about that? So they're starting to think about how belief systems are constructed. And so the first proposition that they make is that we should treat the reality that we're dealing with as psychologists, we should treat human experience as that reality. And so the reality for you from a phenomenological perspective, is everything you experience. They assume everything you experience is real, and they also assume that you can't actually get more real than that. And so your consciousness, whatever that is, is real, and your dreams are real, and your emotions are real, and your pain is real, which is a really useful thing to think if you want to make sure that you're not going to hurt people. You know, you kind of have to think that maybe pain should be treated as a fundamental reality instead of as an epiphenomena of some material substrate. And so that's their first perspective. And they took that from Heidegger, because Heidegger thought that Western philosophy had gone off, got off on the wrong track, you know, 3,000 years ago, uh, because we didn't really concentrate on being itself as the fundamental mystery. And so the fundamental mystery is, why the hell is there anything? And since there is something, experiential being, what are its fundamental elements? And so that's the phenomenological stance. It's, it's completely, it's not the same as a scientific approach because it starts with a different presupposition. You know, the scientific presupposition, roughly speaking, is that things are, the objectively real elements of things are the most real elements. And there's no sense complaining about that because it's an approach that works tremendously well for many, many things, including making hydrogen bonds, for example. But it's also reasonable to think that, well, it might not be the, it might not be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and maybe you could also suspect that the fact that we can manufacture hydrogen bombs also might indicate that there's something a trifle off with our fundamental belief systems, scientific though they may be. And that was certainly something that concerned Heidegger, even though he got all tangled up with the Nazis. So the phenomenologists were trying to take apart experience as such, and they made some, some hypotheses and then some observations. So the first is that we're going to assume that your experience, like experience itself, is real. Now, you just because dreams are real and pain is real doesn't mean, and like objects that we can all perceive are real, doesn't mean you should put them all in the same category. Like my dreams are not in the same category of reality as this table, because you don't have access to my dreams and you have access to the table. But that doesn't mean that my dreams and my pains and my emotions aren't real. Real. So that's the first. Now I, I, you should note that this is a this is a proposition. What they're saying is, let's act as if that's true, and then work from those premises and see what happens. See where we can get with it. And that that's that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do because at the bottom of a theory, you also have you always have to put an assumption because otherwise your theory would be a hundred percent right and would cover everything, and it doesn't. So you have to throw an assumption somewhere in there at the bottom and say, okay, we're not, we're not questioning that. That's the starting point. So, and it, you have to do that because you're ignorant. You don't have a full theory. So they don't like the idea that mind can be reduced to matter. They're not playing that game. They're not playing that the, the game that the subject is only at the phenomenal and the object is real. They're not playing that game either. And it's partly because 
As Boas says, without a subject, nothing at all would exist to confront objects and to imagine them as such. True, this implies that every object, everything objective, is merely objective, in being merely objectivized by the subject, is the most subjective thing possible. It's a radical claim, you know. But here's, here's something to think about. When I look at that Coke can, you might say, I perceive the object, and then I make inferences about its use, and then I evaluate it, and then I use it. And, you know, that is not actually what you do. In fact, it's not obvious at all that what you perceive are objects. And, and if you think about it, well, people weren't perceiving scientific objects until like 1500 AD, 1450. So there was no objective object before then. So obviously, whatever we were perceiving was not precisely that, because we would have been scientists right off the bat. George Kelly claimed that people were natural scientists, you know that we're always investigating hypotheses and trying to disprove them and so on. And it's an interesting theory and in it's right in a sense, but fundamentally it's wrong. We are not natural scientists. We're natural engineers. And when we look at the world, we don't see objects and then infer their use. What we actually see is the use. So, for example, when I look at that Coke can, my, my visual system activates my motor cortex directly. It can do that without me seeing the damn can consciously to some degree because there are people with blind sight. I've told you about those people. They say they can't see, but if you ask them which hand you have held up, they can tell you. So they might not be able to see, but they can map patterns from their visual system onto their motor output. You know, and that's basically what Piaget said we do when we deal with the world. We're embodied creatures, you know. And so what we see when we look around aren't objects. They're things we can use and things that get in our way. You know, and that's theory that was derived originally from J.J. Gibson, who wrote a great book on that called The Visual Approach to Ecological, Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. And his science is a brand of pragmatism. And the pragmatists basically claim that, you know, things, including theories and perceptions, have a limited range of truth. And the truth that, that the, the limited range of truth is determined by the match between your actions and the outcome. So I think this is a Coke can. Is that what it is? No, but it's good enough for me if I want to drink a bit of Coke out of it. God only knows what it is. You know, if you go into communist China and you start advertising these things, then what are they? Because this thing tells a story, right? What's the story? Like, really, do you need Coca-Cola? No, it's like, it's a bit of frippery, you know, it's a bit of, it's not necessary luxury. It's not even very good for you, but it's kind of fuzzy and it's sweet and you get to buy it. And why is that? Because no matter how stupid you are in your nutrition choices, as far as our society goes, you have the right to poison yourself in whatever way you think best befits you. And so when you send this little Coke can off to communist China, this thing screams stupid individuality all over. And God only knows how it undermines the state. You know, and if you don't, if you're not thinking about that, you're not thinking. Think about what happens when we export cars. What does a car say? It says, hey, you can go wherever you want, whenever you want. You don't have to tell anybody at all. And you can do it in a really dangerous, high-speed manner. It's like, you want a political statement? Wrap it up in metal and ship that thing off. And everybody goes, whoa, I'd really like to have one of those. It's like, poof, communism disappears with that. You know, the... There's nothing that says individuality and capitalism like a personal automobile. You know, you even get to pollute the atmosphere and ruin the planet with the damn thing. But, you know, if you have to drive to the corner store and pick up your damn Coke, it's like to hell with the atmosphere. So don't be thinking that the things that appear in front of you are merely objects because they're not. You know, I started thinking about this, for example, when I was thinking about people going down to Graceland to look at Elvis's guitar. You think, what exactly is it that makes a guitar Elvis's guitar? You know, it's not exactly the guitar. Because it's just sitting there like any old guitar, you know, and maybe you could even think about it. You could take that, put another guitar in that looked just like it, and it would still be Elvis's guitar because no one would know. And you might think, well, then that's not really Elvis's guitar. But that's a funny thing, because 
You would only think that if you thought that Elvis's guitar was the thing that was made out of material that was sitting right in front of you. And that isn't what it is. That's only one tiny little bit of it. That bloody thing is, is a part of an incredibly layered reality, right? I mean, the people who want to go look at that, they're looking at it in some sense because of the magic that's emanating from it. But the magic is actually real. You know, the magic is the effect of that guitar, let's say, on the entire culture. And those effects are the damn guitar, too. And it's weird because when you go look at Elvis's guitar, you're not looking at the guitar. You're looking at the magic. And weirdly enough, the magic is actually real. Well, you can't think that way if you're a materialist because you think that the thing is the material. It's like, yeah, right. I can tell Come on. You know, you might be able to have a stone axe, like a well-made stone. And ship that thing off and everybody goes, oh, I'd really like to have one of those. It's like, poof, communism disappears with that. You know, the, there's nothing that says individuality and capitalism like a personal automobile. You know, you even get to pollute the atmosphere and ruin the layered reality, right? I mean, made stone axe because go out and make a stone axe and see how long that takes you. It's like, that's a bit of work. And so if you're a high status guy, if you've really worked your whole life to be at the top of your damn pyramid, you get, maybe you get two axes, you know, it's like a red letter day. You've got two axes, you know, which is more than any other animal has by a lot. So it's not trivial. And then the damn missionaries come in, eh? And they set up shop and what do they bring? Steel axes. It's like, that's kind of a downer, you know. You've worked your whole damn life to get these stone axes and that makes you like head tribesmen. And then you want your kid wanders down to the local missionaries and they say, oh, we got an extra steel axe here. Why don't you take that back home? It's like it's so shocking because not only do the missionaries have this thing that is so much better than a steel axe, it's like a jet plane compared to a to a wheeled cart. Like they're really, really different. But the missionaries, they don't even notice. That's the horrible thing about it. It's like they give away this thing that has a virtually infinite value, and it's like, well, it's okay, we got you know a couple dozen of those sitting in the storeroom, and you know, we're just willing to hand them out. It was a little demoralizing. It was a little demoralizing for the Pacific Islanders. And so, you know, what, was it an axe that the missionaries gave away? It wasn't. You'd think that if you were a Westerner and you had a bunch of axes, it's like, yeah, that's an axe. It's like, yeah, right. It's a lot more than an axe. A lot more. It's a weapon to bring down a whole culture accidentally. One of the things that the phenomenologists claim, this is a cool claim. I didn't know they claimed this. It took me quite a long time to figure this out because I thought I'd figured this out on my own, but it turns out that's very difficult to figure out anything on your own. Now, when I was doing my investigations into how the brain works from a neuropsychological perspective, and that was informed a lot by Jeffrey Gray, who we're going to talk about later, one of the things I noticed was that you don't actually... You don't actually see things when you first see something. In fact, when you first see something, you don't even see it. You react to it. You react to it with your body. So I can give you an example. So you, you, know, you have a partner and you, you have a trusting relationship and then you find out that they're, you know, they tell you or you figure out from their phone or something they're having an affair. And you look at them and you think, well, what do you see? And you think, you see, well, you see the person. It's like, no, you don't. You do not see the person. That's wrong. What you see is a huge pit that you're going to fall into. And you don't even know you see it. But your body knows. As your blood pressure goes through the roof and your heart starts to pound and you sweat. And the reason for that is your body sees what you can't see. And what it sees is something it seriously does not understand. It does not understand it. It sees the territory behind the map. Right? Because when I look at you, 
for all intents and purposes, really what I'm looking at is my presuppositions about you. And because you're polite and well-behaved, you're gracious enough to act in accordance with those presuppositions so I don't even really have to look at you. And thank you very much for that. Because it's very difficult to look at people because they're horrifying and profound creatures. And so everybody walks around behaving so we don't terrify the hell out of each other all the time. Now, when someone betrays you, it's like, poof, presupposition's gone. Okay, what's there? Well, God only knows. And that's what your body reacts to. And that's partly why the phenomenologist said we react to meaning first. We don't react to the object. It takes a long time to see the damn object. So, for example, let's say that your person has betrayed you. Now, you think you knew who they were. And you thought you knew who you were. Ha, guess what? You're wrong. You don't know who they are. And because you're such a moron, that means you don't know who you are. And it means you can't trust any of your memories with that person. And maybe none of your memories in any intimate relationships at all. Plus, what about the future? Well, so when you look at the person, what do you see? You see all that. It's like chaos. Whack. That's what you see. And that chaos is the meaning behind your presuppositions. And that's why the phenomenologists would say... Meaning shines forth. That's famous thy. It shines forth. And that's the primary thing we encounter. It's like, that's smart. And you know what's really weird? That's how your damn brain is organized. And that's weird, eh? Because you think, let's think about it. How do you define reality? Now, that's a tough one. So I would say most of you define reality like your Isaac Newton. Or maybe like your Democritus, who was the first person who hypothesized atoms. And so in the Newtonian world, it's like billiard ball world, right? Everything is made out of little billiard balls, and they bang together in a causal way, and you can predict the consequences of their banging together. And if you extend it enough, you can conjure up an entirely deterministic world. A happens, causes B, B causes C, always the same way, and everything runs like a giant clock. That's Newton's model. And, it's, and it was a clock model because, you know, back at that time, clocks, man, those things were pretty damn impressive. Clocks got the whole industrial revolution underway. And, you know, medieval cities would put an awful lot of time and work into their clocks. And they thought those damn things were really cool. You know, they could keep track of where the planets were moving. It's like, that's a big deal, a clock. And then if you want to think about an invention that changed the world, it's like the clock's a big one. Now we can measure time. In the same way, everyone can measure time. It's a big deal. So the idea that the universe is like a clock, given that the clock can predict the universe, it's a pretty damn powerful idea. Turns out that it's wrong because, you know, causality is a mess. No one really understands it. And there are levels of analysis at which causality, just in the way we experience it, doesn't seem to apply, apply at all. You go down to the subatomic level, it's probabilistic. You can't predict single events. And I don't believe that you can predict the future. You can predict parts of the future in an extremely limited way for some purposes, for some span of time, that, and you can't even predict how long that span of time is going to last. You know, and some things seem to be more stable across more situations and more times than others, but there's still, there's instability everywhere, and it makes it predicting things a very difficult thing to do. Hello? So, okay, so... That's one idea about reality. That's the idea, really, that you have. And that's the reality that you've been educated to have. The idea of reality you've been educated to have. Even though we know it's wrong. Like, it, Einstein blew that world up in the early 1900s, along with the various people that Einstein depended on. That's gone. It's wrong. And then there's all sorts of other extremely complicated problems, like how to model positive feedback loops. You know, that sort of gets you into chaos theory. And, it's really, really hard to model positive feedback loops, and they can go wild in 50 different ways, and you can't really predict them because they depend on initial conditions and, and so on and so forth. So, so the deterministic world is like, no, that's wrong. I think part of the reason we have to have free will is because we can't act deterministically. You know, a deterministic system is only going to work in a system that stays the same, you know, so you can wind up a little clock, you know, one of those little clockwork toys, and it'll walk. But, you know, if you put a cliff in front of it, it just walks off the cliff. So when cliffs are appearing in front of us randomly all the time, so I can't even see how a deterministic system could possibly work to guide us. It would assume that our knowledge, the knowledge that we derive from the past, is sufficiently accurate to causally guide us into the future. It's like, no, that's not right. It doesn't. 
that maybe that's why we have consciousness. No one knows, but that's a good theory, if there's a why. Anyways, here's an alternative. The alternative. This is a Darwinian alternative. So here's the alternative. The world's a complex and dynamic place. It's full of weird things. Basically, it's made up of patterns. It's made up of patterns and patterns and patterns and patterns and patterns of patterns. And that's what it is. And they shift and dance around. And then you throw something that's alive into that. It's, it's programmed by DNA. And the damn thing has to keep up with the patterns. And they're changing all the time. Some of them are kind of stable, but they're pretty damn fluid. So then you throw the DNA in there, and it goes and produces a million variants of whatever it's going to produce. And most of them are wrong. So you're a mosquito. You lay a million eggs. It's like So that's a million bets about how the future will causally unfold. And the bet is the future is going to unfold so this egg can turn into a mosquito. And so then you might say, well, how often is the mosquito that lays the eggs wrong? And the answer to that is if it, if it lays a million eggs in its lifetime, I don't know how many eggs mosquitoes lay, but they lay a lot. All of those eggs are going to die except one, if the mosquito's lucky. And you know that because we're not knee-deep in mosquitoes, right? If, if it wasn't the case, then there'd just be mosquitoes everywhere, and there aren't, thank God. There's enough of the damn things, but, you know. So basically, what's the bet? The bet is mosquito matches environment. Answer, wrong, except once in a million. So how do you overcome that? Million mosquitoes, million eggs, and it'll do the trick. And so look, that's so interesting, eh? because it means the fundamental hypothesis that the mosquito structure matches the structure of reality is wrong at a one in a million. It's wrong at a 999,999 level of error. You might just think that's just completely wrong. You know, that's really wrong. But it keeps the damn mosquitoes going. Okay, so then this propagates across time, you know. And what really propagates across time is a massive wave of death. Virtually everything fails. 99.9% .9 of the species that ever lived are extinct and something like that. You know, and we're doing a fair good job of making sure that a good chunk of the ones that exist now are going to go extinct. You know, so failure and death is the norm, and it's going to happen to all of you. So, if the underlying structure of reality is mutable which it is, and the only way that you can adapt to it is by generating variants and having most of them perish except for the ones that manage more or less by chance to keep up. How do you define real? And a Darwinist would say, and this is what a pragmatist would say too, you embody real to the best degree that real can be attained, and it's not very good. Your real is only good enough for about 80 years. But, you know, what else they would say is that's as real as it gets. The, the, whatever reality is, is so damn complicated, this multi-layered patterned array, that you can't even model it without using death as the, as, the, as the mechanism. You can't do it. And even if you do use death, it's almost all death. And even for the parts that aren't death, which is hardly any of it, your damn solution isn't that good. You know, you're going to wear out 80 years. That's, you got 3 billion years of trying behind you. That's the best you can do, 80 damn years. You know, maybe if you're a parrot, you can get 150. Apparently, there's some immortal jellyfish, which figures it'd be the damn jellyfish that would be immortal. So real might, you know, that's a whole different way about thinking about real. Now, you know, Nietzsche said life is truth. Truth serves life, sorry. And that's a Darwinian idea, even though he didn't take it from Darwin. It's like there isn't anything more true than what evolution reveals as the model for reality. That's as true as it gets for us. And that's not a Newtonian reality. It's a multi-level, patterned, chaotic reality that we're trying to keep up with. And that's real. And so what that might mean is that The implications for action that I derive from that phenomena might be more indicative of what it is than an objective analysis. Because your truth, the degree to which you, you, you embody truth, insofar as it can be determined within a Darwinian framework, 
is entirely measured by your success in living and propagating. And that's it. There isn't anything under that. Now, maybe there is, but if you're a Darwinian, that's it. And I think Darwin is right, all things considered, and Newton is wrong. Plus, we also know that Newton is wrong. Now, the whole Darwinian thing is more complicated than we thought because you, you know, you've run. You know what epigenetics are? How many of you know about that? Well, that's pretty good. So your biological education, like, demolishes your historical education. How many people don't know what epigenetics is? It's okay. It's relatively new. Anyways, it turns out that your parents' experience can alter their genetic structure in such a way that it alters your genetic structure. It's like, oh, that's something. We didn't expect that, that's for sure. And nobody knows what the final you know, consequence of that will be. But it looks like there's more to the evolutionary story than mere random production and natural selection. There's more to it than that. Who knows how much. So anyways, when the, when the phenomenologists say we react to meaning first, that kind of opens a question. It's like, well, is, that, is the meaning real? And that opens another question, which is, what do you mean by real? And then that opens another question. It's like, well, is it Newton real or is it Darwin real? Well, Newton's wrong. That leaves Darwin. And Darwin real? That's about as real as it gets. In fact, that might be as real as it gets. You know, if a partial entity is trying to model a complex totality, all they're ever going to be able to do is embody a partial representation of that. And it's not going to be that good. But it's going to be as good as they can get. And that's as true as it can get. So the phenomenologists, you know, they have this weird idea. We perceive meaning. It's like, guess what? That's how your brain is set up. You first perceive meaning. And then with a lot of work, you turn that into an object perception. Christ, God only knows how much exploration you have to do before you do that. You know, how long do you think it takes a child to handle its, its uh, soother before it builds up an accurate representation of the soother? You know, it's going to be chewing on that thing like mad. It's going to be taking it out and checking it out, turning it around and banging it against things. And it has to do all that including the tactile interaction and the experimentation with the thing across situations to establish, say, object permanence, it has to do all that before it can see the thing. You know, like early AI, early AI researchers who were basically under the influence of behaviorists who basically said the object is given, and so they could treat the brain like it didn't even exist. You know, the object's just there. You can just see the world. It's like that turned out to be seriously wrong. It's damn difficult to get a computer to see the world. Now, it turns out you have to put bloody things inside bodies before they can even do it. Because you really can't perceive the world without a body. Because perception is for bodily action. And without the framework within which... Because really what you're doing... And this is a Piagetian idea too. This is a pattern, this thing. And then... And the pattern exists at multiple levels, including, say, the advertising level and your memories of Coke and all the bloody jingles you know and all that. But this, when I look at that, I map its pattern onto my retina, and the pattern is a pattern because it's extending across time, right? So it's not like smoke. It's not just dissipating. There it is. It's staying there across time. I map that onto my retina, and then the retina matches it onto my hand. That's the Coke can. And actually, the Coke can is all of this. And you might say, that's not what it is because it's made of aluminum. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's made out of aluminum. But that's only one part of what it is. And it's not necessarily even the most important part because it could be made out of plastic. And, you know, what the hell difference would that make? You know? So, so it's pretty damn weird when you start to think about it because people make the claim that meaning is epiphenomenal. It's like there's no real meaning. The universe is this dead thing. And if we all went extinguished, you know, tomorrow... It would just be a bunch of meaningless marbles rotating in space. Well, first of all, even that's not true, because God only knows what's out there if there's nothing to perceive it. You know, the physicists tell us it's more like a vast, potential, fluctuating quantum field. You know, and maybe it doesn't even turn into stars and planets until there's someone to look at it. You know, and you might think that's ridiculous, but if, if you think about it for a while, you'll see that there's really something to it. You know, because you are the thing that specifies the level of analysis, right? You know, the way you look at the world, you don't see the atoms, you don't see the subatomic particles, you don't see the little rocks, 
You see planet-sized things when you look out into space. And, you know, you see it at a particular slice of time that's part of maybe your refresh rate is something like 60 hertz. So what you see is the universe sliced into 60 hertz slices. And you think, that's real. It's like, yeah, yeah, so is all the rest of it, including its huge expanse of time from beginning to end. You don't see any of that. It's there. So what's there? All those things at the same time. And what does all that add up to? The physicists seem to be telling us it adds up to a pool of quantum potential that isn't realized until there's something that conscious, conscious that interacts with it. It's like, who knows? Now, you've got your meaning shining forth like mad. And I think part of the reason that children are so attractive is because for them, the meaning is just shining at them like mad. That's why they're always wandering around like this, you know, and it's really fun to watch kids because they give you a taste of that again. You know, because kids have to pay you so you don't throw them out the window because they're very annoying, right? They're always crying. They're completely useless. They just lay there and they don't do anything. You know, and they wake you up at 3 in the morning and annoy you. And so, you know, because you're selfish and mean, you need some something in return. And so they smile at you, and, but they do other things. They're really, 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 really comical. So they're a blast to watch and play with. But one of the things they really do is they, they remove the blinders from you. While you're around them, because, you know, you go out in like a little forest with a two and a half year old. It's very annoying because the bloody things, they just wander around randomly, you know. So you've got no goal directed. Nothing goal directed is going to happen with a two and a half year old. But that's kind of cool because it frees your mind from your goal directed narrowness. And you can watch the two year old look at all these things that you haven't looked at for 20 years because you already looked at them once. And now you just have to see your memory. And then you think wow, that really is cool. You know, they'll bring you something and they'll tell you it's cool. And, you know, maybe it's a shiny piece of aluminum, a gum wrapper. Well, you think it's a gum wrapper because that's what you see when you look at it because you've already built up gum wrapper representation and you just lay it on that. That isn't what the kid sees. God only knows what they're looking at, you know. Maybe how the light reflects off the aluminum prismatically and how it glitters and how cool it is that it can be folded up and how light it is. It's like, and they're looking at it like this. And, you know, I think it's because their cortex isn't very well developed and they haven't built the inhibitory structures that stop them from seeing meaning shining forth. You know, and you might think, well, is there any evidence for that? And there actually is quite a bit of evidence for that, you know. I mean, one piece of evidence is that if you take a cat's brain off, out, and you just leave it with a hypothalamus and a spinal cord, it's hyper-exploratory. It runs around like everything's interesting. It's pretty weird behavior for a thing that doesn't have a brain. You know, you kind of think that once you don't have a brain, nothing would be interesting. It depends on how much of your brain you have. And there are people who've experienced that, by the way. There was a famous case of a conductor who had a very serious brain injury, and it basically blew out his hippocampus. So he couldn't put any more information in from short-term attention to long-term storage. And he wrote these articles, these, these massive page-long journals, multi-page long journals, and all he'd write is, it's as, as if I'm seeing everything for the first time. It's as if I'm seeing everything for the first time. It's as if I'm seeing everything for the first time. And he was wandering around in a constant state of awe. You know, when his wife would come to visit him, he couldn't remember any of the things that had happened to him. And he'd just be blown out of the water to see her, you know, because he didn't see his memories. And he'd say, it's just like I'm seeing you for the first time. And, you know, he was. He was seeing her for the first time. Because the, the access to the inhibitory structures that were directing his attention were gone. He was an interesting case, too, because now and then he'd sit down to play the piano. You know, and he'd have an epileptic seizure, and then he could play the piano. And he could play just like he used to play, you know. So it was like he had to switch brain modes, and the mechanism for switching was damaged. So he'd have to have a little seizure, and then he could lay out these, like, Beethoven sonatas like a mad dog. And then at the end, he'd have a little seizure, and he'd come back to... It's as if I'm seeing everything for the first time. You know, and I think part of the reason that psychedelic drugs proved so attractive to people in the 60s and have proved attractive to people since the bloody beginning of time is because, in some sense, that's what they do. It's like, poof, your memory representations, they're gone. And what are you seeing? God only knows. But it isn't what you expect. And maybe it's what's there. Well, maybe not, too. All right.
So I'm going to sum this up a little bit. What do you think drives people to extreme forms of pathology? Now, that might be your pathology, your misery, your suffering, and all that. Or it might be your social psychopathology, which is your murderous desire to exterminate. Okay, well, here's a phenomenological theory. The terror management theory is that you've got to build these structures in your head to get yourself away from death anxiety, right? And so really what the terror management people are saying is the blinder you are, the better. And that's what the positive illusion people think too. Now the phenomenologists, they were going at this from another direction. They were saying the meaning that constantly reveals itself is nourishing and revitalizing, although it's so powerful it can just blow you apart. So it's a dangerous thing to be messing with. It's like the burning bush. And you, you have to build a structure in order to be able to cope with that because you have to minimize it to what you can handle. But you need to build the structure properly, properly and carefully so that the meaning that reveals itself can be shaped by you into a world, conceptual and practical, that allows the remaining meaning to shine through in a way that you find sufficiently revitalizing so that you don't become corrupt enough to become genocidal. Now, that's a good theory. And that's what the phenomenologists were on about. And that's part of the reason why the existentialists and the phenomenologists say, don't deceive yourself about what manifests itself to you. Don't use language instrumentally. Why? Because if you do that and twist up the structures that you're using to interpret the world through, the world will twist up on you. And all that will be revealed is its horror. And if horror is all that's always being revealed to you, you will not stay good. Because you can't under that sort of pressure. You'll get bitter and resentful. And everything will fall apart around you because you're not actually modeling the reality in a way that the positive meaning can shine through. So you'll fail and you'll become resentful and you'll become bitter and then you'll be looking for someone to hurt and you'll have plenty of justification for it. So, and worse, and this is union contribution to this whole idea, this won't happen all at once. It'll happen as a consequence of 100,000 micro decisions that you hardly even notice where you can be truthful about something or not in this tiny way that hardly even seems to matter. But that the consequence of iterating that across time, say 300,000 decisions, is that you can build yourself into the sort of monster that you would never want to see in the mirror. And one of the things the phenomenologists would also tell you, and this is something Jung said as well, is that is the sort of monster that you probably are. And so if you want to deal with that, you have to start taking things seriously. And one of the things, there's two things you have to take seriously. And one is the meaning that reveals itself to you. And the other is the stance of truth towards which you approach. The stance of truth that you adopt while you're interacting with that meaning. And the final consequence of that would be your health, the health of your family and your society, and the health of the entire society at large pivots on that. It pivots on that. And that the way the world moves is a sum total of all the decisions that all of us are making, all those little micro decisions. And those bloody things echo like ripples in a pond. And so when you do some little crooked thing that you know you shouldn't be doing, you're actually warping the entire structure of reality. And what's really interesting about that is now we know what happens when you do that. What happens is that we end up with the Nazis and the communists and the hydrogen bombs. And we haven't escaped from that yet. And hopefully we will, but we won't if people don't learn what the 20th century had to teach them. That's that. In the early stages of World War II, now Hitler and Stalin had signed a non-aggression pact. Um, and Hitler invaded 
the Soviet Union anyway. And from what I've been able to understand, the Soviets had prepared an invasion force for Europe at that point, but were not concerned with having to defend their territory. And so they were caught completely unawares by Hitler's move. And the conditions on the Russian front were absolutely dreadful. And Solzhenitsyn was a soldier on the Russian front. And he wrote some letters to one of his friends, which were intercepted, complaining about the lack of preparation and and using bitter, dark humor to describe the situation. And the consequences of that was that he was thrown into a work camp. The Soviet system relied on work camps. And so those were large labor camps of people who were essentially enslaved, many of whom were worked to death, often froze to death, working in conditions that were so dreadful that they're virtually unimaginable. Solzhenitsyn spent a very large number of years in these camps, uh, sometimes in a more privileged camp because he was an educated man, and sometimes in worse camps. He also uh, developed cancer uh, later and wrote a book about that called Cancer Ward, which is a brilliant book. Um, so he had a very hard life. There's, there's just no way around that, to be on the front and then to be in a concentration camp and then to have cancer, that's, that's pretty rough. Now, he wrote the Gulag Archipelago. He wrote a book called One Day in the Life of I Ivan Denisovich first. That was published in the early 1960s when there was a brief thaw. Stalin was pretty much out of the picture by the end of the 1950s. There's some indication that he was murdered by Khrushchev and a, a Khrushchev became uh, premier of, of the Soviet Union after Stalin. And there's some indication, perhaps, that Stalin was either murdered by Khrushchev and a set of his cronies, or when he was very ill, just before he died, was not helped, at least, by, wasn't provided with any medical attention because of the intervention of Khrushchev and his cronies. Now, there's some indication as well at that point that Stalin, who was an absolute, absolutely barbaric in every possible way you could imagine, was planning to start a third world war. And he was certainly capable of doing such things because he had already imprisoned or killed tens of millions of people. Now, just after Stalin died, there was a bit of a thaw in the Soviet Union with regards to internal repression. In the early 1960s, Solzhenitsyn published a book called One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which was a story about one day in the life, his life really, inside one of these so-called Gulag Archipelago camps. Now, he called it the Gulag Archipelago because an archipelago is a chain of islands. And so Solzhenitsyn likened the work camp system in the Soviet Union, which is made up of isolated camps distributed across the entire state, he likened that to a series of islands, and hence, hence the metaphor. And One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich was one of the first publications released in the Soviet Union that dared make public what had happened inside these camps, at least initially. Now, that thought didn't last very long, but that book had a tremendous effect. It's a short book. It's worth reading. Um, after that, he spent, he wrote a number of other books, which are also, he's a great literary figure in the same category, I would say, as Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, which is like really saying something. You know, those, those two are perhaps the greatest literary figures who ever lived, with the possible exception of Shakespeare. Um, he wrote, this book called The Gulag Archipelago, which is published in three volumes, each of which is about 700 pages long. Um, the first one details the origin of the oppressive Soviet system, at least in part under Lenin, and then its full-fledged implementation under Stalin and the deaths of, well, Solzhenitsyn estimated the deaths in, in, in internal repression in the Soviet Union at something approximating 60 million between 1919 and 1959. Now, that doesn't count the death toll in the Second World War, by the way. Now, people have disputed those figures, but they're certainly in the tens of millions, and the low-end bounds are probably 20 million, and the high-end bounds are nearer what Sol Solzhenitsyn estimated. He also estimated that the same kind of internal repression in Maoist China cost 100 million lives, and so you can imagine that the genuine historical figures, again, are subject to dispute, but 
somewhere between 50 and 100 million people. And one of the things that's really surprising to me and that, that I think is absolutely reprehensible, absolutely reprehensible, is the fact that this is not widespread knowledge among students in the West, any of this. And it's because your education, your historical education, if you started to describe it as appalling, you would barely scratch the surface. These were the most important events of the 20th century, and they're barely covered at all in standard historical curriculum. You know of something, I would presume, about World War II and about the terrible situation in Nazi Germany and the death of six million gypsies and Jews and homosexuals in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. But my experience with students has been that none of them know anything about what happened as a consequence of the repression of the radical left in the 20th century. And I believe the reason for that is that the communist system had extensive networks of admirers in the West, especially among intellectuals, and, and still, in fact, does, which is also equally reprehensible. Um, and I believe the, that one of the consequences of that is that this element of history has been under, uh, under what would you say, under-examined and certainly very little attention has been brought to it in the public school curricula. And there's absolutely no excuse for that. It was the worst thing that happened in the 20th century. And that's really saying something, because the 20th century was about as bad as it gets. And so, and the fact that these, these massive, these deaths on massive scale occurred, and the fact that we don't know that deep inside our bones is, is, is a testament to the absolute rot of the education system. So now, you might think this is a strange thing to discuss in a personality course, but I, I have my reasons for doing it. The, the fundamental reason is that Solzhenitsyn, you might regard as an existentialist. Now, he says many of the th same things that Viktor Frankl says. Viktor Frankl wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, which I would highly recommend. Um, and it's a description of, of the corruption that he saw leading into the horrors of the Nazi concentration camp systems, especially within the concentration camps itself, because Frankl was very interested in what sort of psychological catastrophe had to befall a given individual before that person was capable of acting as an agent, say, of the Nazis in the concentration camp system. And he concentrated particularly on these people he called that were known as trustees within the concentration camp system who were generally Jewish individuals who were aiding the Nazis in their death work inside the camps. Now, what Frankl did, because he was also existentially oriented, was attempt to draw a parallel between the individual psychology and the mass pathologies of the state. And so the reason that I believe that this is important in a personality class is because it's necessary to analyze the relationship between the psychological integrity of the individuals with this within a society and the propensity of that society to engage in, say, acts of mass atrocity or to go, com to go completely off the rails and then to engage in acts of mass atrocity. And so it was Frankl's contention and also Solzhenitsyn's contention, and I would say also the contention of Vaclav Havel, who eventually, who was a, an author and playwright in Czechoslovakia and eventually became president, that the fundamental linkage between the pathology and the state the pathology of the state and the individual was the individual's propensity to deceive him or herself and to so to, to fail to act in an authentic manner, in a genuine and authentic matter, manner, and to become, as a consequence, either nihilistic, let's say, or because, because of the uh, incremental weakening of character that's part and parcel of, of adopting an inauthentic mode of being, or to turn to ideological and totalitarian solutions as an alternative to living appropriately and with responsibility as an individual. So Solzhenitsyn in particular laid at the feet of the Soviet citizenry the burden of the absolute catastrophes that characterized that system because of, their, because of each individual's propensity or proclivity within the state to lie and deceive constantly about what they thought and what they said, and to be afraid to speak and to be afraid to think and to be afraid to criticize. And it was no wonder, because criticism, of course, was at least, at, at least became an offense that was punishable by death. But these things start much more slowly than that. And they start with people abandoning their, their own identities and adopting a pathological group identity 
well, for, for any number of reasons, but one of them certainly is their desire to shrink for in, from individual responsibility and their desire for ready-made ideological solutions. And so I'm going, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read you a little bit about the Gulag Archipelago, and then I'm going to show you uh, a sequence of videos about a recent event that I think does a very good job of illustrating how this sort of thing works. And then I'm going to read you some of, the, some of what I've culled from the Gulag Archipelago so that you get a sense of what the writing is like. So Solzhenitsyn basically, he, he committed a huge part of the Gulag Archipelago to memory, which is really something, given that it's 2,100 pages long and printed in, like, seven-point font. And the book is written at an unbelievable level of emotional intensity. It's, it's, I remember there was a study once about how rats respond to cats, uh, free-living rats in, in their burrows, if they're exposed to a cat or even to cat odor, will run back to their burrow and stick their nose out and scream for 48 hours, right, which is about the equivalent of you screaming for three months because rats don't only live about two years. And while that rat is screaming, all the other rats stay in their burrow and don't go anywhere. And so they scream ultrasonically, so you have to record it and then slow it down in order to hear it. But they're not very happy about that, about cats. And they actually um, don't need to be exposed to cats to learn how to be afraid of their odor. They're naturally afraid of it. Anyways, Solzhenitsyn's book, The Gulag Archipelago, is like a 2,100-page scream. It's very, very intense. It's a very difficult thing to read, but it's absolutely crucial reading. It's actually now part of the curriculum in Russia, in high school, which also says something about Russian high schools compared to, say, North American high schools, because I doubt if the typical North American high school student reads 2,100 pages of anything during their entire education in high school, and certainly not something like the Gulag Archipelago. So I'm going to read you a little bit of background about the story, first of all. Um, this is a nice summary um, I've swiped it from Wikipedia, but uh, The Gulag Archipelago is a book by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He won a Nobel Prize for that, for the book, by the way, and he richly deserved it, about the Soviet forced labor camp system. The three-volume book is a narrative relying on eyewitness testimony and primary research material, as well as the author's own experiences in a Gulag labor camp, written between 1958 and 1968. It was published in the West in 1973, and thereafter circulated in Samizdat, or underground publication, form in the Soviet Union until its appearance in the Russian literary journal Novi Mir in 1989, in which a third of the work was published over three issues. So the, the Samizdat, or the underground press, was basically photocopies or, or, or sometimes photostats of banned works that people would compile and then hand from person to person. Uh, of course, the punishment for being caught with something like that was was extraordinarily severe, but the Samizdat was a, I suppose it was the, a precursor to the internet. That's one way of thinking about it, a slow precursor to the internet. Um, Gulag, or G-U-L-A-G, -G, or Gulag, is an acronym for, the, for a Russian term, um, Chief Administration of Corrective Labor Camps, the bureaucratic name of the governing board of the Soviet labor camp system, and by metonymy, the camp system itself. The word archipelago compares the system of labor camps spread across the Soviet Union with a vast chain of islands <clears throat> known only to those who were fated to visit them. Since the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the formation of the Russian Federation, the Gulag Archipelago has been officially published and included in the high school program in Russia as mandatory reading. Structurally, the text comprises seven sections divided in most printed volumes into three parts one to two, three and four, and five to seven. At one level, the Gulag Archipelago traces the history of the system of forced labor camps that existed in the Soviet Union from 1918 to 1956, starting with Lenin's original decrees shortly after the October Revolution, establishing the legal and practical framework for a series of camps where political prisoners and ordinary criminals would be sentenced to forced labor. One of the things that's quite interesting about the Gulag camps, and this is something that's very relevant to understanding of modern Russia, is that so ordinary criminals were put into the camps and so were political prisoners. But the ordinary criminals, and so those would be rapists and murderers, let's say, as well as thieves who were engaged in theft as an occupation, those were regarded by the Soviets as socially friendly elements. And the reason for that was that they assumed that the reason that these people had turned to crime was because the, was of the oppressive nature 
of the previous czarist slash capitalist system, and that the only reason that these criminals existed was because they had been oppressed. They were oppressed victims of that system. And so one of the convenient consequences of that absolutely insane doctrine was that the Soviets put the ordinary criminals in charge of the camps. And these were very, very seriously bad people. And so you can imagine the way that they treated the political prisoners who were regarded as socially hostile elements, sometimes because of their own hypothetically traitorous acts, but more often merely as a consequence of their racial or ethnic identity or the fact that they were related by birth to, say, people who had been successful under the previous system, so who had any any association with nobility or any association with what were known as the kulaks, who were the only successful class of former peasants in the Soviet Union, because they were regarded as privileged. You may have heard that word more recently. They were regarded as privileged and therefore as enemies of the state. And it didn't matter if it was your father or your grandfather or your great-grandfather who happened to be privileged. But the mere fact that you were a, a member of that group was sufficient reason to put you into a camp. And we're talking hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of people who underwent that fate. And so the idea in the Soviet Union was just because you were the member of a class, even as a consequence of your familial association, you were immediately sufficiently guilty to be put into a camp and punished. And the, and the terms for the camps were often 10 years, 15 years long. And if you were very fortunate, you got to have two or three of those. So the, the Soviets really inst- implemented and, and perfected the idea of class and ethnicity-based guilt. It's a very bad road to walk down, and it's something that we're very much engaged in at the moment because there's discussion everywhere in North America now about the idea of, well, race-predicated guilt, for example, and ethnic-predicated guilt. It's a very bad idea to classify an entire group of people as guilty of anything based on their group membership. So these, these sorts of things are things we haven't yet learned and certainly should have. Now, the other thing that was very interesting about the Soviet, especially about the Gulag Archipelago, you see, it was released in the West in about 1973 or thereabouts. Now, the student movement of the 1960s was very much influenced by Marxist and communist doctrine. And that was especially the case in France, where the most reprehensible intellectuals of the 20th century have emerged, emerged, including all the damned postmodernists who have occupied the universities now, as far as I can tell. And what happened essentially in France was that the Marxist slash communist students were attempting to foment revolution. But what happened, and that peaked in about 1968, and what happened was, at least in part, as a consequence of Solzhenitsyn's revelations, the idea that the Soviet model or the Maoist model, for example, could be used as uh, an, an example of the working people's utopia was completely and catastrophically, and at least in principle, finally undermined. Now, there had been, see, because the Western leftist intellectuals, all the, right from 1919 forward, turned a blind eye to what was happening in the Soviet Union. And now and then they were invited there, even people, well, the people who were, who were very well, well regarded in the West were often invited, but, and who were sympathetic to the Soviet Union, were often invited there for a visit, and the Soviets would do the same thing the North Koreans do now when they invite foreigners to visit, which which is that they would set up fake places for them to visit, called Potemkin villages, where everyone was thriving and doing well. The Nazis did the same thing with the concentration camps to begin with, especially the ones they established for children, and they would invite dim-witted leftist Western intellectuals to come to the Soviet Union and see the wonderful paradise that had been set up for everyone, which was a complete and utter facade and sham, and then they would go back to the West and report on how the utopia was progressing precisely according to the Marxist doctrines. And we knew from the 1930s forward, because Malcolm Muggeridge did this to begin with, who investigated what was going on in the Soviet Union, I think for the Manchester Guardian, and he started reporting in, 19, in, the, in the late 1910s and then the early 1920s, if I remember correctly, it was approximately in that period, maybe a bit later, he recorded what was happening when the Soviets attempted to collectivize the peasant farmers. And so what they did was take all these people who were previously pe- serfs, right, only a couple of decades previously, which was not much better than being a slave, they were basically property. And that was happening until about 1880 or thereabouts. The serfs were emancipated. Many of them ended up holding their own land, right? So the land was distributed from the nobles to the peasantry. That was something that Tolstoy was, uh, Leo Tolstoy was involved in. 
And by the time the Soviet re Revolution came around, which would be uh, at, at the latter part of the 1910s, after the First World War, the peasant class had actually established farms, of course, varying productivity. Some of the peasant farmers were very, very good at being farmers and produced a huge proportion of Russia's and Ukraine's food. Uh, because one of the things, we'll talk about this later as the class progresses, one of the things that you'll find if, if you look at creative production in any domain, it doesn't matter, artistic domain, food production, um, novels written, novels sold, money generated, number of companies generated, um, number of goals scored in hockey, etc., any, any, or n number of paintings painted, number of compositions written, anything like that, where, where the fundamental underlying measure is human productivity, what you find is that a very tiny percentage of people produce almost all the output. It's called a Pareto distribution, P-A-R-E-T-O, and it was studied in detail in scientific productivity by someone named DeSola Price. It's a square root law, so here's the law fundamentally. If you look at the number of people who are doing, who are, who are in a given domain, who are producing in a given domain, the square root of the people produce half the product. So that means if you have 10 employees, three of them do half the work. But if you have 10,000 employees, 100 of them do half the work. Right. It's a very, very vicious statistic. And you won't learn about that in psychology for reasons I have no idea about because you learn about the normal distribution and not the Pareto distribution. But Pareto distributions govern, for example, the distribution of money, which is why 1% of the people in the general population have the overwhelming amount of money and one-tenth of that one percent has almost all of that, right? So I think it's like the richest hundred people in the world have as much money as the bottom two and a half billion. And you think, well, that's a terrible thing, and perhaps it is, but what you have to understand is that that law governs the distribution of creative production across all creative domains, right? It's something like a natural law, and we can, we'll talk about that more, but imagine what happens when you play Monopoly. You've all played Monopoly. What happens when you play Monopoly? One person ends up with all the money, all right? Then you play another game of Monopoly. What happens? One person ends up with all the money. It's actually the inevitable consequence of multiple trades that are conducted randomly. So if you take a 1,000 people and you get them to play a trading game, you, get, you each give them $100, say, or $10, and they have to trade with another person by flipping a coin. I, I win the coin toss, you give me a dollar, you win, I give you a dollar. If we all play that long enough, one person will end up with all the money and everyone else will end up with zero. So it's a deeply built feature of systems of creative production and no one really knows what to do about it because, of course, the danger is, is that all the resources get funneled to a tiny minority of people at the top and a huge section of the population stacks up at zero. But to blame that on... The oppressive nature of a given system is to radically underestimate the complexity of the problem. No one actually knows how to effectively shovel resources from the minority that, that controls almost everything to the majority that has almost nothing in any consistent way. Because as you shovel money down, it tends to move right back up, and it's a big problem. Anyways, the reason I'm telling you about that is because after the peasants were granted their land and started to become farmers, a tiny minority of them became extremely successful, and those people produced almost all of the food for Russia and, and Ukraine. So what happened in the 1920s when bloody Lenin came along and collectivized the farms was that they defined the kulaks, who were these tiny minority of successful farmers who maybe had a brick house and were able to hire a couple of people and had some land and some livestock and were, were very productive people. They defined them as socially unfriendly elements, and they sent groups of intellectuals out into the towns to collectivize the farms. And so the idea was that while well, you would pool your land, and, and everyone would farm it collectively, and the land was taken away, of course, from the tiny minority of people who were actually productive and had actually managed to own much of the land. So you have to imagine how that would occur. Okay, so it's in the 1920s. It's after the world after World War One. Russia's in pretty bad shape. The villages are full of brutalized men who have post-traumatic stress disorder and lots of people who are not doing well at all. And the bloody intellectuals come into the town and they say, you know those successful farmers up the street that you've always been pretty jealous about in your useless manner? Well, they're actually kings and demons who are stealing from you, so why don't you come out, we'll form a nice little mob and we'll take everything they've got. And that's exactly what happened. And all those people were killed or raped 
or set off to Siberia in the middle of the bloody winter where there wasn't even anything for them to, to anywhere for them to live or anything for them to eat. So they all died. And then the consequence of that was a few years later, six million people starved to death in the Ukraine. And Malcolm Muggeridge had been reporting on that since the 1930s. And so that was the that was the first wind, really, that the West got of exactly what was happening in the Soviet Union. But even at that point, the bloody left-wing intellectuals in North America were so damn clueless, and in Europe, that they never paid much attention to it, with, with the exception of a certain number of people like George Orwell, who wrote 1984 and, and, uh, and uh, Animal Farm, which is, of course, a discussion. The main pig in Animal Farm is Stalin, of course, and it's a story, an allegory about the Russian Revolution, whose basic motif is we're all equal, but of course some, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And that's the motif, that's the motif of Animal Farm. So there have been warnings all the way through, right from the beginning of the Russian Revolution to the West about exactly what was going on. But because communist and Marxist ideology is very good at addling the, at the weak minds of idiot intellectuals, there was a huge section of the population who was fomenting, I suppose, against the standard what would you call it, political, psychological, and social order, who were, were absolutely committed to, you know, the ethic that's encased in statements like from each according to his ability to each according to his need, which sounds perfectly wonderful if you think about it for about 15 seconds, but if you think about it for six months, becomes unbelievably murderous in its reach and, and, and intent. And so, anyways, the French, for whatever reason, seem to be particularly opaque to reason I'll give you an example. So um, the doctrine of Paul Pot in Cambodia that also killed about 6 million people. Hit, so what they did in Cambodia once the revolution occurred was decide that everyone in the city were parasites on the countryside because the countryside full of farmers was where the primary production was taking place. And they regarded the city dwellers as parasites on that fundamental production. So they basically emptied out the cities and sent, out, sent all the people in the cities out to work in the country as forced labor, and six million people died there, and the chief architect of that bloody project got his PhD from the Sorbonne and said exactly what he was going to do when he went back to Cambodia, was cheered along by the French intellectuals who thought that that was just a fine idea. So that's all background for why I don't think any of you guys really know much about 20th century history. So anyways, what happened in the 1970s when, when Solzhenitsyn published The Gulag Archipelago was that it was so brilliant the book and so overwhelming in its emotional and intellectual and historical power that it became impossible for anyone to continue to claim that Marxism slash communism had any intellectual or ethical integrity whatsoever. It was done. It was done. And that's part of the reason why he won the Nobel Prize. And part of the reason, by the way, why the Soviet Union collapsed, because once word got out about exactly what was actually going on, there was no way of making a coherent argument in favor of, say, exporting the workers' revolution around the world. It's like the consequence of that was well documented by Solzhenitsyn. You see, and the Western intellectuals tried to make excuses for what had happened in the Soviet Union by blaming it on Stalin's cult of personality, perversion of the original accurate Marxist doctrine. So they basically said, well, Lenin had Lenin lived, because he died quite young and was replaced by Stalin, had Lenin lived, the promised utopia would have been delivered. But Solzhenitsyn, being an absolute genius, documented the relationship, number one, be between the axioms of Marxist and communist thought and the laws that were generated primarily by Lenin and the, and the construction of these camps and the dekulikization and all the mass murders. He documented the causal relationship between them and laid them clearly at the feet, not of Stalin, but of Lenin. And so that was also a major blow because it, it undermined the remaining argument of the left-wing, radical left-wing apologists in, in, in the West for the, for the viability of Marxist-slash-communist doctrines. And you still hear people today, many people, when they're faced with the, you know, if they're, if they're, if they're Marxist in their orientation and they're faced with the data pertaining to what happened in the Soviet Union, They'll say something like, well, that wasn't real Marxism. But one of the things that you might answer to that is, well, fine, except that in every bloody country in the world where that doctrine was implemented, regardless of the wide cultural differences between the cultures, say the Soviet Union, China, Cambodia, 
and so forth, exactly the same thing happened every time. And we still have a great example of that today in the form of North Korea. I don't know if you've ever looked at a map of the world at night. You know, you can get a map of the entire globe at night. You look at South Korea, it's lit up like jewels. It's nothing but light, like the east coast of the United States and Canada. And North Korea is dark. And the reason for that is that 50, 60 years of barbaric, communist, despotic rule means a country that's completely unindustrialized, where every single person is malnourished or starving to death, where everyone lives in terror all the time, and where there's nothing but the continual production of labor in labor camps, just like in the Soviet Union and Maoist China. So if we were willing to pay attention, we could still see examples of that today. And that's not an anomaly. North Korea is exactly what you'd expect, given the doctrines upon which it's founded. So, all right, so more on the gulag. At one level, the Gulag Archipelago traces the history of forced labor camps that existed in the Soviet Union from 1918 to 1956, started with Lenin's original decrees shortly after the October Revolution, establishing the legal and practical framework for a series of camps where political prisoners and ordinary criminals would be sentenced to forced labor. It describes and discusses the waves of purges assembling the show trials in context of the development of the greater Gulag system with particular attention to the legal and bureaucratic development. The legal and historical narrative ends in 1956, the time of Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech at the 20th Party Congress denouncing Stalin's personality cult, his autocratic power, and the surveillance that pervaded the Stalin era. Though the speech was not published in the USSR for a long time, it was a break with the most atrocious practices of the Gulag system. Solzhenitsyn was aware, however, that the outlines of the system had survived and could be revived and expanded by future leaders. Despite the efforts by Solzhenitsyn and others to confront the legacy of the Gulag, the reality of the camps remained taboo until the 1980s. While Khrushchev, the Communist Party, and the Soviet Union's supporters in the West viewed the Gulag as a deviation of, of Stalin, Solzhenitsyn and many among the opposition tended to view it as a systematic fault of Soviet political culture and an inevitable outcome of the Bolshevik political project. Parallel to this historical and legal narrative, Solzhenitsyn follows the typical course of a ZEK, a slang term for inmate, derived from the widely used abbreviation Z slash K for Zalyuchenyi, Zak Yucheny, I guess, prisoner through the Gulag, starting with arrest show trial, and initial internment, transport to the archipelago, treatment of prisoners and general living conditions, slave labor gangs and the technical prison camp system, camp rebellions and strikes, the practice of internal exile following completion of the original prison sentence, and the ultimate but not guaranteed release of the prisoner. Along the way, Solzhenitsyn's examinations detail the trivial and commonplace events of an average prisoner of life, of an average prisoner's of life, prisoner's life, as well as specific and noteworthy events during the history of the Gulag system, including revolts and uprising. Aside from using his experiences as an inmate at a scientific prison, Solzhenitsyn draws the testimony draws from the testimony of 227 fellow prisoners, the first-hand accounts which base the work. One chapter of the third volume of the book is written by a prisoner named George Yorgi, probably Tenno, whose exploits enraptured Solzhenitsyn to the extent that he offered to name Tenno as co-author of the book. Tenno declined. Solzhenitsyn also poetically reintroduces his character of Ivan Denisovich toward the conclusion of the book. When questioned by the book's author if he has faithfully recounted the story of the Gulag, Denisovich, now apparently freed from the camps, replies that, you, the author, have not even begun. The sheer volume of first-hand testimony and primary documentation that Solzhenitsyn managed to assemble in the Gulag Archipelago made all subsequent Soviet and KGB attempts to discredit the work useless. Much of the impact of the treatise stems from the closely detailed stories of interrogation routines, prison indignities, and, especially in Section 3, camp massacres, massacres and inhuman practices. There had been works about the Soviet prison camp system before, and its existence had been known to the Western public since the 1930s. However, 
Never before had the general reading public been brought face to face with the horrors of the gulag in this way. The controversy surrounding this text in particular was largely due to the way Solzhenitsyn definitively and painstakingly laid the theoretical, legal, and practical origins of the gulag system at Lenin's feet, not Stalin's. According to Solzhenitsyn's testimony, Stalin merely amplified a concentration camp system that was already in place. This is significant, as many Western intellectuals viewed the Soviet concentration camp system as a Stalinist aberration. Solzhenitsyn documented that the Soviet government could not govern without the threat of imprisonment, and that Soviet economy depended on the productivity of the forced labor camps, especially insofar as the development and construction of public works and infrastructure were concerned. This put into doubt the entire moral standing of the Soviet system. In Western Europe, the book eventually contributed strongly to a need for rethinking of the historical role of Lenin. With the Gulag Archipelago, Lenin's political and historical legacy became problematic. Yeah, problematic. And and those factions of Western communist parties who still based their economic and political ideology on Lenin were faced with, were left with a heavy burden of proof against them. George F. Kennan, the influential U.S. diplomat, called the Gulag Archipelago the most powerful single indictment of a political regime ever to be levied in modern times. The book was published at a time when many communists in the West were already rethinking their relationships with the USSR, as many were deeply disappointed by the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. In Germany, it sparked discussions not only about Leninism, but also how to deal with the memory of World War II. In an interview with German weekly Die Zeit, British historian Orlando Fijes asserted that many Gulag inmates he interviewed for his research identified so strongly with the book's contents that they became unable to distinguish between their own experiences and what they read. The Gulag Archipelago spoke for a whole nation and was the voice of those who had suffered. After the KGB had confiscated Solzhenitsyn's materials in Moscow during 1957 to 1967, the preparatory drafts of the Gulag Archipelago were turned, turned into finished manuscripts sometimes in hiding at his friends' homes in the Moscow region and elsewhere. While held at the KGB's Lubyanka prison in 1945, Solzhenitsyn had befriended Arnold Susi, a lawyer and former Estonian minister of education, who'd been taken captive after the Soviet Union occupied Estonia in 1940. Solzhenitsyn entrusted Susi with the original typed and proofread manuscript of the Finnish work, after copies had been made of it both on paper and on microfilm. Arnold Susi's daughter... Heli Susi subsequently kept the master copy hidden from the KGB in Estonia until the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. The KGB seized one of the only three extant copies of the text still on Soviet soil, and the people who held the copies were unaware of the existence of the other copies. This they achieved after interrogating Elizaveta Voronskayana, one of Solzhenitsyn's trusted typists, who knew where the typed copy was hidden. Within days of release by the KGB, she hanged herself. The first edition of the work was published in Russian by the French publishing house Editions du Soy a few days after Christmas 1973. They had received a go-ahead from Solzhenitsyn, but had decided to release the work about 10 days earlier than he had expected. News of the nature of the work immediately caused a stir, and translations into many other languages followed within the next few months sometimes produced in a race against time. American Thomas Whitney produced the English version. The English and French translations of Volume 1 appeared in the spring and summer of 1974. Solzhenitsyn had wanted the manuscript to be published in Russia first, but knew this was impossible under conditions then extant. The work made a profound impact internationally. Not only did it provoke energetic debate in the West, a mere six weeks after the work had left Parisian presses, Solzhenitsyn himself was forced into exile. Because possession of the manuscript incurred the risk of a long prison sentence for anti-Soviet activities, Solzhenitsyn never worked on the manuscript in complete form. Since he was under constant KGB surveillance, he worked on only one part of the manuscript at a time, so as not to put the full book into jeopardy if he happened to be arrested. For this reason, he secreted the various parts of the work throughout Moscow and the surrounding countryside in the care of trusted friends, sometimes purportedly visiting them on the, on the social calls, but actually working on the manuscript in their homes. 
All right. So now I want to show you some things. I haven't done this before, but we'll see how it goes. I'm going to show you something that happened recently. Some of you may be aware of this and some of you not. So this is a video about there was a, there was a town meeting that a number of people uh, uh, spoke at, including one shopkeeper from New York. And uh, after the meeting, he was interviewed by the, the, pr the press, the TV, and one of the attendees at the meeting was upset about the fact that the press was concentrating on him instead of concentrating on what she regarded as the issues at hand. So I'm going to play this for you to begin with. Now, what I'm trying to show you, I want to show you what it means for someone to be ideologically possessed. And so you can tell when you're talking to someone like that, because this is something I learned from reading Solzhenitsyn, is because you can predict absolutely everything they're going to say. Once you know the algorithmic substructure of their political ideology, which is usually predicated on about five or six axioms, you can use the axioms to automatically generate speech content. You don't even have to hear the person. You can just predict what they're going to say. And so that alleviates any responsibility whatsoever they have for thinking. And it also allows them to believe that they have full control and full knowledge over the, not only full control and full, full knowledge about the entire world, but also the capacity to distinguish without a moment's thought between those who are on the side of the good and those who are not. And that's where the danger really comes. So anyways, we'll take a look at this. So right now, um, the news is interviewing uh, a person whose daughter um, was a heroin addict, I think, is what he said in his public comment, and he's pro-bunker, he's pro-cops, and so he's the one getting interviewed, and there are like a million people who have spoken about how they've been uh, abused by the cops, but they're not being, they're not being spoken to, only the person who's pro-bunker, who's also a person of colour, so they got their token. And that's the one that they need to I know I don't find out.